Okay, so I guess this is it regarding logistics. So we can now move on to the first uh, lecture. So Professor Mario Figueiredo is actually a professor, a distinguished professor in technical. Um, he's uh, also the head of... Uh... Oh, sure. Yeah. So as I was saying, he's also the head of um, Loomlis, this uh, Ellis unit. Well, he's a, an, an Ellis fellow as well. And the lecture is going to be about machine learning with linear models, okay? So we're just setting up here the environment. And yeah, seems to be working. Okay, let's welcome Mario. Okay, can you hear me well? Great. So good morning. Uh, this is the 13th time <laughs> I'm giving a lecture at this uh, summer school, but this is the first time that I'm giving this one. Okay, in the previous 12 editions, I gave the what we used to call the zero the day zero zero day uh, warm up on probability statistics, algebra, all the basics, which are not specifically uh, machine learning. But this year, I'm I'm covering these um, learning with linear models, which is actually. Uh, it was planned for, for a long time ago when, when he started, it was planned for Andrea to give it, but Andrea is away at ACL, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. And this is the, the slides that I'm, I have his name there because these are slides that we shared. These are actually slides that are sort of uh, adapted from our course we teach together, with, also with, with, uh, with uh, other colleagues, namely Francisco Melo, uh, a course on deep learning here at IST, a master level course. And this is sort of a, an adaptation from part of those, of those slides. Okay. So, of course, as it moves, it moves. So I'm teaching from the iPad, which I, I sometimes do at home, but never. This is the first time I, I teach from the iPad uh, yeah, live. Okay, let's see how it, how it goes. So you may ask, why linear model? Who cares about linear models, right? It's 2023. The, every, everybody is excited about uh, LLMs and, and, and deep networks and everything. Why, why do we care about linear models these days? So why? Well, there are many answers. So one of them is that the underlying machine learning concepts are the same. So we, uh, we start studying machine learning. You don't start from, from the most advanced models, but you start from, from the basic ones. All the basic concepts are, are there already. It's much easier to understand them mathematically because they're much simpler. So both from, from, from a computational point of view, from an analysis point of view, everything is much simpler because of course it's just linear, although that's a bit misleading. They're still widely used, okay? I, you may think that it's all about just deep learning these days, but it's not. If you don't have enough data at the end, I'll show you something uh, really surprising, uh, very recent uh, results. Uh, so they're still widely used. They're, they're especially effective if you don't have a lot of data. So everybody knows, probably most of you will know that deep learning requires a lot of data, typically. And they are a component of deep networks. So deep networks are essentially a lot of linear models put together, right? Uh, so the last layer is a linear model. Every neuron is a linear model. So everything is a linear model. So every, locally, everything is linear. If everything that's continuous in the world locally is linear. So linear is, is good and it's good to analyze. So for example, this is a, a picture that shows that no matter what's behind a big, big deep neural network, if you're classifying in the end, it's just like if you have a little linear model, that's a linear classifier that's trying to classify the image. It doesn't matter what is behind. If we just look at the final layer, essentially what we're looking at is a linear classifier. And for, for, uh, basically during this lecture, what we will ignore is everything that's behind. All the, the, the everything that extracts features from whatever you're doing, be it image analysis or text or whatever, I don't care. I just care about the final layer. Okay, then we will expand this a bit. Okay, so what we'll see today. So we will look at, uh, let, I forgot to mention, Stop me, interrupt me, ask questions, say, oh, we already know all of that. Just go, go ahead, or, or I, I don't care what he's saying. So please interrupt if you, if you feel like you have to. Okay, so we'll cover linear regression, which is the basics, the most, the, the simplest of all linear models. And it goes back uh, at least to Gauss. So it's really, really, really old. Uh, so then we'll jump into classification, both binary and multi-class. Then we'll spend a lot of time looking at linear classifiers. We'll start with perceptrons, which are 70 years old. Then we'll move to logistic regression, which is maybe, maybe 70 years old, maybe also. 
but it comes from statistics rather than from computer science. Support vector machines. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about support vector machines. Then we'll talk about some innovation, which actually is, is due to to Andre and and uh, um, and Ramon, who is somewhere over there. Is he here? No, sparse Max. He's not here. Uh, he's outside. Uh, we'll talk about uh, optimization. So the basics. We'll see a lot more of, of these in in the labs. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about similarity-based classifiers and kernels, which are strictly speaking not linear linear models, especially. Uh, uh, but but uh, but we'll see how they they fit into this this picture, okay? So let's start with some notation. So it, we'll talk about essentially or exclusively in this talk about supervised learning. So it's a problem where you have an input and an output, and you want to learn how to predict the output from the input given a bunch of examples. That's it, okay? It's it's very simple scenario. So we have an input, and input can be many things. For now, it's just an abstract object, say a news article, an image, a sequence, a piece of speech signal that you want to understand, whatever. Uh, so it can be anything. So I, this set, capital X, will not have any structure. It's just a set, OK? No, nothing special about it. And the output can be many different things, OK? It can be just a binary label. Say if, you have a, if you're building a, a, a spam detection uh, software, it's just classifying emails as spam or not spam. It can be the topic of a text or of an email, if you're classifying emails into topics. It can be an image segmentation, yeah, as complicated as that. It can be uh, many different things. It can be, it can be a sentence. Um, it can be many different things. We'll use always this notation, x, comma, y, to denote an input-output pair, if, if you know it. And examples of input-output pairs could be stuff like a news article and the topic uh, of the article. Say so you have a news article about sports, so it will be the text of the article or some something that represents the text of the article and the topic, some label that says sports. Uh, a sentence together with its translation. So in machine translation, the input would be the, the original sentence that you want to translate, and the output will be the translation for that sentence. An image with example of what I mean by segmentation for that image. So it, the X would be the image and Y would be some way of representing the regions after I segment the image. And so I could go on and spend like half an hour giving you examples of pairs, but uh, I think you've got uh, the idea. Okay. So now um, in supervised machine learning, this is the, the fundamental thing that I told you already is that we have a collection of input output pairs. So there are all lots of variations. There also, there's also semi-supervised learning. Where you have, in addition to these, you also have lots of axes for which you have no labels. Um, and that's semi-supervised because you have some supervised pairs, some unsupervised pairs. If it in the realm of unsupervised learning, you would only have the axes, not the y's, and you would be asked to do something about the axes, say cluster them or, or, or find out if they belong to some subspace or something like that. But we will not touch that today. We'll talk only about supervised learning. So you have training data. Training data is a collection of objects each of which is a pair, so an input-output pair, <clears throat> which is given to you by someone. To, 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 and the, the goal is to learn how to, to repeat this, this, is to find a function that is able to predict the output from the input. I didn't write this as a set. Some, sometimes people call it a set. I'll, I'll call it a set myself further on, but it's technically it's not a set because there may be rep repeated. There's nothing that prevents the same pair from occurring. You have the same example several times, it can happen. And in that case, it's not a set because in mathematics, a set cannot have repeated objects. So it's just a collection, which is a, a, a less formal uh, object in mathematics. So the goal is to learn a predictor that of course does what you expect it to do, which is given some new input, X predict or infer what would be the correct output for this input. So for a new one that you had not seen before. Okay, so the, the goal is to do inference or prediction or classification or regression or whatever we'll see that so hopefully okay and i won't be very formal about these we we expect that if to that little x that i saw there was some uh label that i didn't know about some outputs i hope that my prediction is uh, similar uh most of the time to what the correct y would be and this is in, in the, the word for this in machine learning is generalization i hope that the machine that i learned is age this predictor, this classifier, this whatever, this network can be whatever you want it to be, just a function, uh, generalizes well. It means it, it does reasonably well outside of the training set, assuming, of course, you, you need to assume stuff like the, the new sample 
is of the same nature as the samples that you saw. So there is, it belongs to the same distribution somehow. So this can be formalized, and but that goes into the realm of, of sort of more theoretical machine learning, which we will not see here today. Okay, so standard approach. This is the, the completely dominating paradigm in, in machine learning, in supervised machine learning, is to uh, create some this quantity called empirical risk, which is very easy to understand. So the empirical risk is the sum across all the all the let me see so the sum so there's this sum across all the data points of some little function l which is a loss function which specifies what it specifies what loss you incur if you for for, for the example i you predict age of xi but the true label the true response was y so there's some function that measures how much you lose by doing this prediction if and the correct uh, response was yi okay there's many different loss functions uh, we will see several i as sum across all the data set and then i minimize the sum of these losses with respect to the function age but i need to specify what what i mean by function age okay it cannot be just any function of course it needs to be a function that i can implement that i'm interested in some class of functions so typically we write these as a as a capital H as a model class. So it's a class of of, of functions that I'm yeah, I'm in, within which I'm looking for the the, the optimal predictor in in this sense the, the one that minimizes the empirical risk. So this ERM empirical risk minimization is just this problem. Okay. Of course, this this model class depends on, on so this model class could be the class of all neural networks with a certain size, or the class of all linear predictors with a certain um, set of inputs, or or the class of polynomials, or whatever. Whatever it depends on the problem. It's very, it, in, in this case, it's very very general. There's nothing more to say about this. Again, stop me if you have questions. Okay, so. Essentially, uh, well, this again, there's more than this, but uh, the the most basic uh, sort of taxonomy for these classes of problems. I'm looking at my face there, and I see that they're cutting my hair. Okay. Then I don't look good on YouTube. No, this is better. Uh, so the 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 the, 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 the top of the taxonomy, we, I, we could arguably say that these problems are divided into into two types of problems. So regression when the thing that we want to predict is a quantity and this can be we can go on a philosophical discussion of what we mean by a quantity so is a is a natural number a quantity well certainly is uh but uh is it continuous no it's not so people sometimes say regression is for continuous uh prediction but uh integers are not continuous this discrete set so it has not to do with discrete or continuous but with quantitative or not quantitative nature of the prediction uh, then there's discrete or categorical. It's, again, I don't like the word discrete there. It's more like categorical. And the, the key distinction is that in classification, the, the set in which you are building the prediction is has no order. Okay, You're classifying, uh, a, 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 say, a, a text into one of several classes. And the set of classes has no order. You can put it in any order. And the order plays no role. Okay, it's different. For example, if you're if you're learning a system that tries to predict like ratings of a movie, for example, one star, two stars, three stars, you can see it as five categories, but the order matters. So, the difference between one and two is smaller than the distance between one and five. Okay, although it's just five and it looks like classes, it's different. Sometimes it's called ordinal regression, but we won't go into that. So, this it's not very clear cut what we mean by quantity continuous and discrete it's I prefer quantitative and categorical are, are more uh, i think are more precise terms okay regression examples of regression are for example if the output set is say the real line just from real number or some number between zero and one if you want say think of it as a probability if you want or a positive number if you know that the quantity that you're predicting is necessarily non-negative or it can be many other things okay so for example given a news article and we'll see that as a very toy example you want to predict how much time a user will spend reading it so if you if you open most uh say a site like medium for example you have a little number up there that that is an estimate of how how long it takes to read the article so that if it's too long you just forget about it uh and and look for another shorter article uh so that's an example of of, of a, a regression problem given some object try to predict a number okay uh, there are 
countless examples of regression. Okay, uh, this is all of science essentially is about regression. So in multivariate regression is a is a uh, thank you for that. Multivariate regression, you know, predict not one quantity but a vector of quantities, say k quantities. Okay, it could be a signal. So the samples of the signal it could be an image, the pixel values of the image. It can be uh, it could be the 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 simplex or distributable notation we'll use later on. Let me put this in red because it's easy to see. So this is, who knows what the simplex is? Let me just get a feeling. Who know what the simplex is? Don't worry if you don't. I'll explain it later. Okay. Okay, don't worry. Forget about that symbol for now. We'll come back to it. Uh, so for example, multivariate regression, say if you're doing image processing, all of signal in image processing are essentially multivariate regression problems where you have some, some data and you want to produce another set of data, say the denoised image, or if you want to estimate class probabilities in a classification problem rather than just classifying the objects, then you're predicting numbers, which are probabilities that actually have to belong to that little triangle there, which is called a simplex. In classification, it can be just a binary classification, say plus one, minus one, say spam detection or fraud detection in, in credit card transactions or uh, when you get identified in your phone by by putting your finger on, on the on the on the fingerprint detector it's essentially binary classifier that recognizes it's you or not, or not you uh so there's the world is full of binary detection problems and multi-class classification okay if you have uh um, more than than binary so this there's a lot of usually distinction between binary and multi-class there's no distinction at all it's just a number of classes that changes from two to more than two uh, the fundamental thing is that the order is irrelevant. That's why it's called classification and not regression. I write them as one, two, three, up to K, but I could write A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and I could swap the order. It doesn't matter. The order doesn't, doesn't play any role. And then finally, there's structured classification where the output sets as a dimension that is not a priori specified. Okay, it depends on the input typically. So for example, uh, in machine translation, you have a sentence and the output sentence, you don't know a priori. Before you do the translation, you don't know how long it's gonna be, okay? It depends on the sentence, not only on the length of the input sentence, but also on the contents of the sentence, okay? So we don't know a priori, it can be exponentially large, it can be arbitrary. By exponentially, we mean the fact that if, it, if, if it's a sequence of symbols and each symbol um, has a certain set of possible values, say letters, the number of possible configurations or the number of possible sentences grows exponentially with the length. That's why we typically call it exponentially large. Although the key the key issue is not the exponentially large nature, but the fact that it's undetermined, it's undefined a priori. Only in the end, you know how long it was. Okay, it's not. It can be have different sizes. So machine translation, caption generation, image segmentation, etc. This uh, can all be seen as structure classification. There's more. There's more to it than 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 just this. But uh, we will not talk about structure classification today. You'll talk about it on Monday when uh, Noah Smith talks to you about um, uh, sequence models. Okay, just a little uh, few words about reductions. What we mean by reductions? So reductions uh, are ways of of reducing a problem to another easier problem or simpler problem. Or, uh, or more convenient problem, let's say. So for example, logistic regression, which you will see reduces classification to regression. So classification is the problem of determining the class of an object, but in logistic regression and other techniques, rather than determining the class, what we do is we predict the probability of each class. So if it's a probability, it's a number, if it's a number, it's regression. Um, and so the logistic regression reduces classification to regression and regression is sort of simpler in some sense. Uh, so one versus all reduces multi-class to binary. I'll, I'll come back to this later on. I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. Okay. What about features? Okay. So feature engineering. So remember the picture with the, the, the network and all the features that are computed somehow, and then the final layer. And so most of the work in machine learning, computer vision, image analysis, natural language processing, up to the explosion of deep learning some one decade ago was essentially focused on feature engineering. What features should I extract from objects so that I can do whatever I want to do, like classify them or predict the quantity from, from those objects, from, from those features. And so feature engineering, uh, and today engineering is sort of given a bad rap, but uh, I disagree. It's very important to be able to do feature engineering. 
is or some people argue was an important step for for linear models okay because the models are very simple so they need to rely on very powerful and expressive features uh, so for example bag of words for for text was a very classical feature so for for a document so bag of word is just a, a, a vector that counts it has a it's a it's a, a bag as the name implies it's a bag of counts of how many times a given word appears in a document and that's a, that's a feature of a document it, it tells you something about the document if some word appears many times in a document if the word say money and rates and and stock appears a lot in the document it's probably a document about uh trading uh and if ball and and gold and keeper and a referee appear a lot in the text it's probably about sports uh, so bag of words are contain a lot of information about the text, but of course it's not the same amount of information that the text itself contains. It's just a, a simplified uh, um, extraction of, 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 of distilling information in the in the text that is good enough, hopefully, for the task that we have in in, in front of us. So there are many uh, many other things. So in image in computer vision, for example, people spent decades looking for good features. What should I extract from the image? So that then I can classify the object. Is it a building? Is it a car? Is it a? And it's uh, it's decades, literally, from since the 70s. There are tens, let's say, hundreds of thousands of papers written on how to extract features from images. I don't know, maybe hundreds of thousands. It's not an exaggeration. Well, all sorts of things. Okay, features can be categorical, can be boolean, can be continuous, can be many different things. So that, as I was saying, there's decades of research in many areas, machine learning, in natural language processing. People uh, got in, um, uh, insights from, say, linguistics to, to, to try to guess what would be the good features to extract so that I can then do whatever I want to do. So in, in all of these areas. And then uh, maybe today is not as important because we can learn some of these Directly, we'll see that, but uh, it's in, in many areas, it's still very important. Okay, so what feature representations, and we will we will carry on throughout all the lecture using feature representation, which I will introduce in, in this slide, okay, which is essentially uh, written as a map. So there's this map, phi, which maps from the objects to a vector of the dimensions, okay? So this function is extremely important because it, it encapsulates the details of the object. I don't care what the object is. It's hard to deal with specific, with objects. What it sees in mathematics or in machine learning, it's easy to deal with a vector. Everybody knows what to do with a vector. A vector is just a, uh, an array of numbers. That's it, okay? And the objects can be many different things, okay? So once you have, once you cross from the object side, which is X, to the vector side, which is RD, vectors of the dimensions, you forget about what the objects are. You don't care what the objects are. Someone designed those those five functions that extract features and now you forget about it and you just deal with vectors so this is very important because it encapsulates it it decouples the feature extraction part from the actual machine learning part so this this phi of x is a feature vector it's called a feature vector the feature map is phi phi of x is a feature vector for object x it may be very high dimensional it may be very low dimensional it depends on on the problem though it's not necessarily high dimensional and these feature vectors actually can be can mix categorical and continuous. And they say, well, if it's categorical, what do you mean categorical? Well, continuous, I, I'm violating my own uh, promise, which is not to call it continuous, but numeric, but it's okay. Um, categorical, it's not in RD. So R, RD is that's a vector of numbers, of D numbers. What do you mean by categorical? But categorical variables can be written um, uh, as as a binary vector. So a categorical vector in K that has K different possible uh, categories. Can be written as a vector that has with k dimensions, dimensional like k, such that it's zeros everywhere except one in position, uh, whatever the position is. So if category is y in position one, this is called the one hot uh, encoding. So we can put these inside these these ones and zeros are real numbers. Uh, so we can put these inside the vector, and so we can mix everything, and we have can have can, uh, numerical and categorical features all together in the same vector if you want. Um, so in in uh, in uh, in NLP, it was very classical to have these long pipelines of, of processing, um, with uh, with stack which which are constituted by stacking together different thing, modules that do different things, and many of them are just linear classifiers. So each each classifier prediction uh, is used to handcraft or to engineer features for the other classifiers that comes next, and so this is the 
the origin of the word pipeline. It's a pipeline of, of processing uh, modules. So examples of features used in, uh, in uh, say, natural language processing would be where the currencies, thus given where the cur or not in a, in a, in a text, say, a word counts, how many times uh, a given word um, appears, a part, part of speech tags, if it's, if it's uh, for example, if important to know if it's an adjective or not, for if you're doing sentiment analysis, spell checking, if you can, if you have a spell checker, you can check the spelling. So this first, for example, is very, it, it's important for spam detection because it used to be the case that spam uh, email had a lot of spelling errors. Maybe not so much these days. Um, so an example of an old-fashioned kind of approach to these based on, on engineered features would be, for, this is a, an example by, by André, not, not by me, uh, so assessment of quality of translation. They have a translation from Google Translate, does the machine translation work? Translation, le travail de traduction automatique. So it's, it's a wrong translation, of course. Uh, it's not what it says. It's not too far, but it's not right. And so people try to assess the quality of the translation without knowing an actually true translation. And for these, you design lots and lots of different features. You put these all together in a huge vector that, that contains all these features for the translation. The number of tokens in the source and target segments, language model probability of the source, average number of translations per source word, blah, 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 blah lots of things. So as you see, this requires a lot of domain knowledge. Only someone who knows a lot about translation can come up and... and, and and find out that these are good features to assess quality of translation. So it's very, it's very domain knowledge intensive. So in a sense, so feature engineering, this idea of designing features by hand using experts is a black art. It can be very time consuming. It requires a lot of domain knowledge. For example, linguistics, you need to know a lot of linguistics if you want to, do, to design features for natural language processing uh, by hand. <clears throat> Uh, on, on the other hand, it allows encoding prior knowledge. Okay, if you know something about the problem, and you, and, and and if you really know, and if what you know is important, then a way of a way of of bringing this knowledge into the problem is by feature engineering, and this is a form of inductive bias. So inductive bias is a, is an expression that's used in machine learning to 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 express the idea that when you when you learning when you're doing it's impossible to solve to to tackle a machine learning problem without bringing into the problem some bias, which is called an inductive bias because you're doing inductive learning. Your, your inductive learning means that you're learning a function, which you then later use, you're inducing a function from examples. And you have you put a bias on that function. So you choose a specific form of function and that, that carries an inductive bias into the problem. So because you, the, the, the way, you, what, what you bring into the problem is the definition of the class of functions in which you will look for the optimal one. So it's still widely used in practice. So people still do feature engineering a lot, okay? Especially if you don't have a lot of data that would allow you to, to, to use uh, feature learning, representation learning, like deep learning methods. Of course, the modern alternative, which is sometimes sort of euphemistically called representation learning, but it's essentially deep learning. It's, it's, uh, it's a modern alternative. It's, it's, what, uh, it's what's mostly studied today. Um, and this will be the topic of tomorrow's lecture. So Bishka Raj will be giving you the talk tomorrow about uh, deep learning. Okay, so that's it. Bye bye. No, I'm gonna go. On. So this I could stop here <laughs> and say, okay, now we have deep learning. We don't need all the rest, but we we do. Okay, so this was sort of a introduction. Now let's go. Let's get a little bit more technical. Not a lot. And let's talk about um, regression. So that's the, the outline. So we'll talk about regression, and then we'll talk about classification, those perceptions of this regression, support vector machines and sparse marks. Then we'll talk about regularization. And at the end, although this is called the linear models, we'll talk about nonlinear models. OK, so as we know, any question at this point? No? Great. So regression, goal, output a quantity, so a number, say, a real number or a number between zero and one. An example, simple example, the one I was mentioning before. You, the task is you have an article and you want to predict how long the, will a user, average users spend reading it so that you can show it when you show the article that, uh, that the predicted uh, reading time is seven minutes, okay? And you can think of a very simple uh, way of looking at the article. So this is actually, this is not correct. This should be, although here actually it's X, but what we really mean there is phi of X. 
uh, because x itself is the article and phi of x is just a number that you extract from the article. But in this example, we will just use x to denote the number of words directly. Um, and why is the reading time? And you have examples, okay? Of course, you could, you could think of using other features. So how difficult are the words? If you have some way of measuring how many long, how many words longer than say 10 characters are, are there in the text? Uh, how the punctuation, how many uh, full stops and commas are there? So you can you could try to be clever, more clever than these, and just measuring the length, just trying to measure somehow the complexity of the text to do this estimate. But in this example, I'll just use the number of, of words. Okay. So how to define a model that predicts uh, the, the reading time from, from the number of words? Okay, well, you can think it grows linearly. Okay, that's a bunch of examples. It doesn't look very linear, but let's try to assume it's linear. So by assuming it's linear, I mean that the, 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 the estimate is some constant W times the length of the article plus an offset plus B. Okay, and the model parameters are W and B. So this is very, very basic. I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen this before or something like this. So the model parameters are W, the slope of this line, and now you're given training data bunch of examples those blue points so in the horizontal axis you have the the length in in words of the articles in the vertical you have um, the minutes spent reading the article and we, we see there's this tendency if it gets too long then people have loose patience and probably they abandon the article or they they speed it up when they're reading so it doesn't grow it doesn't seem to grow linearly and so the classical choice for this is least squares. Okay, so the loss function, we've talked about loss in the beginning. So this is the empirical risk minimization uh, criterion here would be to sum across all the examples, the square of the difference between the actual reading time and the predicted time, which would be W times X plus B. Compute the difference square. Why square? Many reasons. First, uh, you don't care if you're underestimating or overestimating, you're penalizing the difference equally up and down. You could do this with an absolute value. We'll talk about that in a second. You could do it in many other ways, but square is good. But the real reason is that this becomes easy to solve because it's square, it's differentiable. You can compute the derivative set to zero and solve and have an analytical solution. So every time we use squared loss, you can give a lot of reasons why, but the real reason why it's so used is because it's computationally easy. Uh, that's the true reason people don't it's, don't really sometimes don't uh, assume, but it's a real reason. It's because it's easy. Uh, although it's also acceptable, but it, it's easy. Okay. Um, and so you can try to solve this. We will see how to solve this in a second uh, in a more general case. Okay. So, but you look at that and say, so this is the fit. If you solve that problem with respect to W and B, you get that straight line. Yeah, it's okay, but it's not great. Uh, and so, okay, let's try to do a little better. Let's try to get smart and do polynomial regression. Okay, that looks like quadratic, maybe cubic, I don't know. Uh, let's try, how, how do we do this? So uh, we do this by now computing a, a more sophisticated feature mapping, which is now in this case, uh, I'm using X now just as a number of words and phi of X now is the mapping. Although this, this should be, um, we had another function that goes from the object to X, but forget about that. So we assume now that uh, the prediction is a linear combination of powers of x, okay? So the w transpose phi, so w transpose phi of x is just the same as w, it's w zeros. Remember, note, notice what phi of x looks like. It's one and the x and x squared and x to the d. So what this, you have here is w zero plus w one times x plus w two times x2 plus whatever, uh, all the way up to d. So if you want to do polynomial regression, you can still write it down in this very compact notation, w transpose phi, as long as you let phi of x be all the powers, okay? Um, and the bias b, so this is a, also a very uh, common thing to do. You throw away b, you don't include b. Remember there was b here, this bias, which is the, the intercept, how, how high the, the, the line is. You throw it away and you, you put it, uh, you hide it inside the feature vector by putting a one in the first component. And then in that case, as, a, as a, I noted there, um, W0 plays the role of B. It's the, the offset, the global offset of, of the curve. Okay. So now you can write, let's go down, let's go back and write the, the 
the square data loss. It's called the square data loss or squared loss, sum across all points of, of the error, of the square of the error, which is easy to show that it can be written compactly using linear algebra notation. If you define this, this function x, okay, function x contains simply the feature vector transposed at each row, okay? So this, this matrix X would have something like these. The first column is all ones. Second column is X1, X2, up to Xn. So the the, the length of, of, the, of the examples from the example one to example N, the second column would contain the squares of these numbers. And if you have more powers, it, can, it would have more columns, okay? This is very well known. Probably if you've studied statistics, you know this is called the design matrix in statistics. It's called just uh, the regression matrix or whatever you want to call it. And so we can write these and it's easy to see that if you multiply these by W, you have W1, or W0, W1, WN. If you multiply this matrix by these, you have exactly at each component of the result, you have uh, precisely these for each example. So you can write these compactly. In this, uh, it's a square of the Euclidean norm, which is so the sum of the squares of the components of that little vector up there, x times w minus y squared. Okay, and then and this has a closed form solution. How do we find solutions for for these problems? How do you find a solution for a problem? How do you minimize a function? Compute the gradient. So this is the kind of thing that I'm assuming you know. You compute the gradient. You set to zero. You solve. In this case, it has a closed form solution. Very famous x transpose x minus one x transpose y so this is the solution for for linear regression it's called it goes by it has the dozens of different names depending on the area because this expression is used in many many areas so in statistics it's sometimes called ols which stands for ordinary least squares it's called um, well least squares estimate it, it, it least squares regression it goes by many names okay Notice that although we're now dealing, the function that we obtain is not linear, it's quadratic, say, or cubic, we still call this linear regression because what matters is not linearity with respect to, to the input, but linearity with respect to the parameters, okay? That's what linearity, so it's still a linear model. It's still X times W, it's a linear operation that I, the, 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 the interaction between the features and the weights is linear. It's just a product, okay? um th that's what that's why it's still called linear regression although it's non-linear so this is what we get by going from one to two we get now a quadratic fit which is much much better right you would agree that it's much better and uh with with little or no cost at all okay so how do we say okay oh, well d sounds good what about three three d equal three maybe even better okay we saw so this opens the, the 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 opportunity to talk about underfitting and overfitting. Okay, so we saw a clear example of underfitting. What is underfitting? Underfitting is when the model class that I'm considering in the left model class of all straight lines is not expressive enough to capture the actual behavior of the data. So it's clearly human would look at that and say, "Nah, this is not uh, rich enough. It's too simple." the one the other one looks okay okay choosing d equal to seems okay the question is why not go to three or four or five or six okay well if we choose too high we get, run the risk of overfitting in fact you know that if you try to fit if you have like 50 points and you try to, to fit a, a polynomial of order 50 you can do it with zero uh, error you can go exactly through each point although the i'll show you an example in a second well not a second but uh, maybe half an hour uh where that that uh, shows. So there are many ways to avoid overfitting. Okay, so I, from the bottom, in this from this perspective, we avoid overfitting by using some way of choosing finding using some way of choosing d. The act the the the, the a good choice for the model complexity in this case for polynomial regression, which is the simplest example. The complexity is controlled by the order of the polynomial. The higher the order, the more complex the function can be. But you can also use regularization, which we will see later on. Okay, let me just talk a little bit about. So this is a cartoon from XKCD. This 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 uh, lecture has an unusually low number of cartoons from XKCD. I usually have at least five. Uh, so this is the idea that. Remember when I talked about inductive bias, the, the function class that it choose. Okay. If you've never seen XKCD, who has never seen XKCD or who has seen XKCD? So XKCD, 
it used to be much better than it is now, but it's great. So there's science and math and uh, cartoons about almost anything you want to find. So there's there's thousands. And let me zoom in. Okay. So curve feeding method. So depending on what you choose for the model class, you can extract different messages from the data. And this is very important to keep in mind when you're doing uh, data analysis. So if you choose a linear to have those points, you have to choose a linear function that, as we did, and you can brag, say, I did linear regression, okay? But it's not very clear, so you can use a quadratic function or you can use, say, a logarithmic function and you fit them using least squares. And you get very different results. In one of them, it seems like the whatever phenomenon is sort of accelerating and the other seems like it's slowing down, okay? Of course, it's noisy data, it's not a lot of them, so you can do an exponential feed, you can do lowest, you can do uh, linear with no slope, and you can, can extract different conclusions from, you can do logistic fit, you can do many different things. So depending on your on the bias that you bring into the problem, so the idea that we can actually let the data speak by itself and make no assumptions, it's usually false. We always have to make assumptions. And the assumptions have an impact on the conclusions and the information we extract from the data. This is it. Okay. So let me just make this a parenthesis and, and, and show that this least squares criterion has a probabilistic interpretation, a very simple probabilistic interpretation. So which is this one? Okay. What, what is the probabilistic assumption that underlies um, least squares estimation? Not just the, the computation of convenience that we can solve it in closed form because we can compute the gradient easily. Uh, there's an underlying assumption which is that the, the observations that we have are just obtained by some real, some true underlying model, which has the correct form. So it's some W uh, inner product with some feature vector of that for each point. And then there is noise contamination and the noise is Gaussian independent across all the samples with a fixed uh, variance Sigma two. So I hope I'm, I'm assuming that you all know what this notation means. Everybody knows what this notation means? Gaussian density, okay. So n, so when I say that some variable x follows a Gaussian distribution, so this is, uh, we have, should have day zero with the, with the probability refresh. Uh, let's go back. So Gaussian distribution, this means that uh, this variable follows a Gaussian distribution. Actually, let me put a mu there. Just a, uh, a parenthesis. So it's a Gaussian distribution, which looks, something like this. So the probability density function of this variable looks like this. It's a very Gaussian mean mu. And the width of this bump is controlled by this quantity sigma two, which is called the variance. Okay. Which means that the distribution, so the probability of X, or in this case, let's say N, takes the form one over square root of two pi sigma two, exponential of minus x minus mu squared divided by two sigma two. So this is a Gaussian distribution, okay? Most of you, if you took a probability and statistics class, maybe in some countries, even in uh, the last year of high school, you get this. In, in engineering or science schools, you've seen a Gaussian in the probability and statistics introductory class. So sigma two is fixed, so the variance is fixed and they all follow the distribution. Distribution is very important not only because it leads to distractible uh, inference procedures, but also because it occurs a lot in nature, because it, it's the distribution that things that are the sum of many important uh, components converges to. It's called something called the central limit theory. But I digress here. Okay, so and you know, you assume that there are some true parameters, W star. Okay, this is what I was writing. So in the conditional distribution, it says that if you condition on X, the distribution of y will follow this Gaussian uh, form, takes this form, where the mean is w star transpose x, uh, phi of xi, which is, the, say, the noiseless value. And then any observations are random uh, perturbations around the noiseless value. And these perturbations are independent from sample to sample. Okay. And now what we can show, I'll show you the next slide, is that the least square solution, which is the one we got before, this least square solution, whoops, whoops, going back, this one, okay. These, or, or you can write it like this, as the minimization of that, is the same as the maximum likelihood estimate under this model, 
What do you mean by the maximum likelihood estimate? The maximum likelihood estimates, this don't get scared by this slide. Uh, it's very easy. So the maximum likelihood estimate or the maximum likelihood criterion specifies that you should choose as estimate of the parameter, the one that maximizes the probability of what you have observed, okay? So the, depending on the choice of the parameter, you get different probabilities for what you have observed. But what you have observed is fixed, right? Because you have observed it. So this is fixed. These are the observations, these are fixed, okay? And these are fixed, but these are deterministic. I'm not, I'm not uh, considering them as random. Okay, so these are the, the lengths of the different texts that you observe, for example, and those are, you assume that they're given, okay? Then you observe the, the reading time, say the Ys, okay? And now you can choose the parameter estimate that makes those observations the more probable possible. Okay, you're trying to fit the model so that it explains the data well. Okay, so you're going to maximize with respect to W. That. Okay, now these are standard assumptions that, so because everything is independent, so the keyword here, independent. So I'm, I'm missing the, the basics of probability lecture because independent means that the probabilities are the factorized. So you have two different, if you have two variables, X and X and say X and Z, and if they are independent, then I'm sure you all know that the probability is R, the probability density is factor. It's just a product of the two. So the fact that the joint distribution, that you're assuming that they're all independent, means that you can write this joint distribution as the product of each one of them for each sample. And then since you're maximizing, you can maximize a function or its log. It doesn't change because the log is monotonic. And the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So the fact that you apply the log, transforms a product of p's into a sum of logs of p's, okay? And now we have a log of a p, but p looks like this, okay? When you take the log of these, how do you compute the log of a product? Is the sum of the logs. So you have the log of this part. How do you compute the log of one over something is minus log of that something. How do you compute the log of a square root? It's one half of the log of what's inside. How do you compute the log of an exponential? It's what's inside the exponential because the log is the inverse function of the exponential. So if you go slowly, this is in all books about this stuff. If you can read it so if you want, you can write, you can, the log just extracts the exponent from the exponentials of the Gaussian, okay? And there's an, this additional term, which is becomes, it comes from the normalization constant of the Gaussian from, from this part here. It's just a constant, it doesn't depend on W, so you can just ignore it because you're maximizing with respect to W. You can just throw it away. And now, you, you, since you're maximizing, this two over sigma two doesn't change anything because it's just a scale factor that does not depend on W, so you can also ignore this part. And you, you end up with what we had started with, which is the least squares criterion, which is a sum across all the data points of the square of the error between the observation and the prediction. And that's what we called least square solution. So least square solution and maximum likelihood estimate, assuming that the noise is Gaussian are the same, okay? So not only least square is good because it's computationally easy, it's the easiest. Also because it makes sense, right? It's the square of the error. People used it even before knowing about Gaussians. Well, maybe not because Gaussian invented it, but okay. Uh, it also has this, this other justification. Okay, this is the conclusion. I was saying. There are many other regression losses that you could use instead of the square of the difference between the prediction and the true value or the, the given value. You can use the absolute value. Okay, this is called least absolute deviation. Or you can use a Uber, something called the Uber loss, which looks like, so they're, they, they're plotted there. So the square is this red line. The absolute loss is the, is the blue line. It's the, just the absolute value. And the other one looks like quadratic around the origin and then it goes up as linear. So why do we use these others sometimes for something called robustness? Suppose you have those uh, six data points there, okay? What happens if you do least squares regression, if you try to fit a straight line to those points using a squared error, okay? You get the blue line, okay? The blue line is the least square solution. Okay, it's very strongly influenced by this point here, which seems to be an outlier. So if it was a lab experiment, that problem, that point there was probably some, some measurement error. 
okay and the fact that it's we're using a quadratic loss makes it very very sensitive to points that are very far away because the influence of a point grows quadratically with how far it is from the line okay if you replace these by the absolute value of the difference okay now we get the the whatever yellow line there which completely ignores the other point okay i'm not going to show you but anyone knows what the solution is if you have if you're doing straight line regression on a bunch of points and this, the criterion is not minimizing the square of the errors but minimizing the absolute value of the errors where will the straight line go anyone knows no one knows no one's ever seen least absolute deviation regression what you get is a line such that there are as many points above as below it doesn't matter how far they are it just matters how many are above and how many are below so if you have a line and you take one of the points at above and you move it to a million whatever up it doesn't change because it's, all, it's already above it stays above okay so it so at least absolute deviation regression produces a regression that's robust to outliers in this sense because it doesn't it doesn't care about where the points are other than if they're above or below the line they don't care where they are just above or below it's above it's okay it's below it's okay so that's why it's called robust okay now ridge regression uh, and is a, is a way, something that was invented in the 50s to solve the following problem so remember that this was a uh, linear regression that we had we had the closed form solution and this closed form solution as you see it requires computing this matrix inversion i'm sure you all know what inverting a matrix means so you need to build the matrix and then compute its inverse but what happens if this matrix is not invertible well you cannot solve the problem because you cannot invert this matrix and when is it that a problem is such that this matrix cannot be so inverted well for example if the features are collinear suppose you have you have a bunch of, of objects and you have the feature vectors and two of the features are exactly collinear one of them is twice the other okay or two of them when added together give you another feature okay the features are not independent in this case this matrix i'm not going to go into the linear algebra details is something called rank efficient it does it cannot be inverted okay and in that case you cannot compute least square solution okay i could go into the reasons but i don't want to go into that so the solution that was invented by hurl and kennard in i think 59 okay that's let's let's relax and let's do some some uh cheap trick which is let's add an identity matrix times some lambda uh to the to the matrix before inverting it okay and now it can be shown that this matrix even if this one is not invertible now this whole one this x transpose x plus lambda i is invertible for any lambda that's larger than zero no matter what x is okay this matrix is always invertible okay and this is what uh this is why it was created okay so this is equivalent so i'm using this norm i, I did use before this is equivalent to instead of solving the original problem so the the the, the problem without um the least squares problem is is just these without this term so this would be least square solution by putting this uh term okay this is equivalent to solving to the, this is equivalent to this problem okay these are the same okay it's actually if we compute the gradient of these to solve it you get the gradient of the norm squared is just the two, twice the vector and so you you get what what's above so I, I don't want to go into the details because this is not a lecture just about linear regression um so these are so what this shows is that what actually you're doing when you're doing ridge regression is adding a penalty so you're not only minimizing so this term here is trying to choose w such that it explains well the data but the other term is trying to prevent w from being too big okay you're trying to keep the norm of w small because you're trying to minimize the sum of two things so there's a trade-off between w being able to explain the y's well in the sense of minimizing the square error loss but also w should not be very large okay so that's what typically reg regression and regularization in general what it does not all of, of regularization but the, the basic forms of regularization are essentially trying to contain w not to be too large the weights okay so the in the in different contexts this, this goes by different names so for example in neural networks this um this uh regularization is called weight decay okay uh maybe you will see why tomorrow i'm not sure because when you do gradient descent this corresponds to slightly decaying the weight it also is called penalized least squares it goes by by, by different names 
Okay, now I've had a slide that shows that these criterion using L2 regularization is equivalent to assuming that the weights follow a Gaussian distribution, okay? And that we use this as a prior for, for the problem. But I'm gonna, it's a very, it's essentially the same type of derivation that we did for the least squares to the, to the uh, maximum likelihood. So I'm gonna skip it. It's in the slides, you can look at it later, okay? The conclusion down there is that L2 regularization is exactly the same as maxima posteriori regression with the Gaussian prior. Maybe some of you have seen this before, but it's again, very standard material from, from estimation. I'm gonna skip it because it's not very. Okay, so now this motivation is nice. Okay, we have this problem that what happens if X transpose X is not invertible? Well, we need to use this, we need to add this guy here to make sure that this matrix now is invertible. So notice that what this does is after you compute X transpose X, you add lambda to all the elements of the diagonal to make sure that the matrix is invertible. And you may say, oh, but if, if it's invertible, I don't need it, right? So who cares? I just use it if it's not invertible. It turns out it's not the case. Uh, so even if the least square solution can be computed, the reach, so the regularized version may be better, okay? Let me give you an example. So I have 21 points. I'm gonna fit a 14th order polynomial, which seems to be very high, okay? If I only have 21 points, fitting a 14th order polynomial seems dangerous, uh, and it is dangerous, okay? So if I essentially do not regularize, I'm, 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 what I'm plotting here is lambda, here on the, so these horizontal axes are lambdas, actually log of, logs of lambdas, okay? So if lambda is, it is for, I, I'm not, no, you cannot see it. So this is uh, log of lambda in this, in this above plot, log of lambda is minus 20. So lambda is really, really small. It's like essentially zero, okay? And so of course you have overfitting because you're fitting a 14th order polynomial to 21 points. So it's very noisy, okay? In this bottom example, uh, log of lambda is, um, even I can see very well, minus eight, okay? So it's a much bigger, so it's a natural log. So it's e to the minus, lambda is e to the minus eight. And in the above case, it's e to the minus 20, okay? This is not lambda actually, I was, this is not lambda, of course. This is x, okay? This is x. Lambda is, this is, refers to this plot and refers to this plot, okay? And now we got, what we can do is, since I, I know the, the actual underlying function, it, this is a toy problem. I think this is from Murphy's book. Uh, now we can generate other points, which are not those points that are those 21 points, but other points on the same function and test and assess how good the function is. How good, and that's the red line there. And what we see is that if we look first at the blue line, what we see is that as, as Lambda becomes bigger and bigger, okay, the training MSC, so the mean squared error in the training goes up and up and it goes down. Actually, if lambda goes to zero, this would go to zero, okay? Because not, not to zero, but a very small value because I'm fitting a 14th order polynomial to 21 points. It's not zero, but it's a very small value. I can go very close to all the points. It's not zero. Um, but as lambda goes up, okay, I get a smoother line, okay? So the error goes up, but if I now test the line on other points other than the ones on which I've I've trained, I get that the minimum of the MAC is for lambda somewhere around here, I guess, something like here. It looks to be, maybe it's this one, okay? So it's not for lambda equals zero, okay? The MAC, the least square solution exists, and still it's better to use a non-zero regularization parameter, okay? We'll come back to these later on. Okay, so now let's move on to classification. So before multi-class, I hate this word multi-class because two is also, it's also multi. Multi is more than one, but okay. Let's look at binary. Output set minus one plus one, it could be a B, red and green, uh, whatever. It's just a pair of objects, but it's very convenient to write it as minus one plus one for mathematical reasons, okay? Examples we already saw, say fake detection, uh, um, whatever, okay? There's lots of examples. And of course, now what we need to is some, how to define a model that predicts place one minus one from some object X that we saw. So the classical thing to do, the simplest of all linear classifiers is something that computes a linear function, 
as we saw. So now we have a weight vector, an offset, a feature vector phi. And now I just take that quantity, which is, so this is a real number. And I compute its sign, okay? And if the sign is uh, it's positive, it's the, that quantity is larger or equal than zero, then I decide for label one. If it's negative, I decide for label minus one. You may ask, what do I do, what do, what do, I do when it's equal to zero? Then it's arbitrary, okay? Just, I, it's chosen like larger or equal here, but it could be less or equal below. It doesn't matter. It's just one point, just, uh, it's arbitrary. Okay, so intuitively, and we'll use this word a lot, this quantity inside, quantity inside the sign is a sort of a score for the positive class, is how much you believe uh, that this, this object is, is from class plus one. The higher this value, the further away you are from zero, the stronger your belief in the fact that it's a class one and vice versa for class minus one. Okay, so the sign function converts from continuous to binary, I say from numeric to binary. And the decision boundary, so the points that are exactly on the boundary, are those for which this score is zero. Okay, and if you notice something that, that takes the form W transpose, I'll show a picture in the next slide, W transpose phi plus B equals zero, it's a hyperplane in the space where the components, where the, 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 the co coordinate uh, are, are the components of phi of X. Okay. That's why it's, this is called a hyperplane classifier. Here it is. Okay. So important. So this, this axis, so this axis here would be, so the horizontal axis would be phi one of X. So it's the first component of the feature vector. And the vertical axis is phi two of X. Okay. And a classifier, a hyperplane is that black line there that's controlled, it depends on W. Let me make these reds, W here. So W, this W that appears here, this vector, is a vector orthogonal to the boundary, okay? And B controls the distance of the boundary to the origin. So the distance from the origin to the boundary, it's B divided by the norm of, of W, okay? So notice that for any point that I get, okay? So when I do these inner products here, this inner product. If I have some point that I need to classify, say I have a point here. The first thing I do is inner product with W, okay? So when I do an inner product with W, I have to take this point, this is some phi of X, and I'm gonna compute the inner product with W, which is I'm gonna compute how far it is. So what, when I do this, I'm computing how far this point is from the origin. So I'm looking only perpendicular to the, to, the, to the boundary. I just care how far it is from the boundary. I don't care about any other properties. So if I move, if I move in this direction, I'm staying at the same distance from the boundary. So the score does not change. If I move in this direction, closer and further away from the boundary, I'm changing the score, okay? And this fact is expressed by, by, by the operation of computing inner product between W and phi. Okay, and then B is just an offset. Okay, it's just how far the boundary is from the origin. It clear? If you understand this picture, you understand linear classifiers. It's all basically all in there. If you think a little bit about this picture, you you easily understand. So the question now is, how do we learn these boundary, meaning W and B, from data collection of data? Okay. So first of all, a very important distinction is data that is separable and data that is not separable. So I say that the data set is separable if there is at least one linear boundary that separates the points in class minus one, class plus one without any mistake, okay? And it's not separable if no matter what line I put in there, I cannot do it, okay? That's not linearly separable. Because separability depends on the class of models that I'm considering. In this case, it's linear separability. If I allowed other sorts of functions, then I would need to say, well, this is not separable under these class of functions. But in this case, it's just linear separability. So of course, the one on the right is not linearly separable. So what we'll present next is a, a very old algorithm, really old from the 50s, that is able to find such an algorithm, such hyperplane if it exists. Um, as I mentioned before, so I'm, we're gonna get rid of, as we did for, for regression, I'm gonna get rid of the B. I'm gonna get rid of B by assuming 
that the first component uh, of, of phi is, is a one. Okay, we, we saw that before. So I'm gonna say that phi zero is one. And so W zero plays the role of B. We saw this before for regression. So I'm just writing everything is just W transpose phi so that I don't have to carry around the, this offset term. Okay. And so let's go, here is the perceptron. So the perceptron looked like this, 1957, okay. Uh, at the Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory, Frank Rosenblatt, very famous. Who have heard about Frank Rosenblatt and perceptron? Oh, well, a lot of people, this is in the news, okay. So this was a sort of can be seen as the first artificial neural network. It goes back a long time. It was built in hardware. Actually, the learning was done by mo in little motors with potentiometers, so it was really cool. It actually worked, uh, and it classified images. And it had actually more innovations than people uh, give it credit for, namely projection onto higher dimensional spaces, sort of like a kernel, but it's, it's, it's seldom mentioned, okay? And the hype was as, as big, at least as today, with uh, ChatGPT. Um, it says uh, stuff like, um as you can read in the blue i don't know if you can read it can you read it perceptrons will be able to recognize people and call out their names and instantly translate speech in one language to speech or writing in another language mr rosenblatt said in principle it would be possible to build brains that could reproduce themselves on an assembly line and which would be conscious of their existence so this is 1957 58 okay it's the same same talk we're having today about, uh, say, ChatGPT. They were having in 1958 about perceptrons, which is just a bunch of neurons, a bunch of potentiometers and engines. Okay. So how does it work? So uh, recently, the, there's this uh, quite famous machine learning researcher called Ben Recht, who's a professor at uh, Caltech. He writes a blog post which is called uh, I forgot what it's called. I can I I, I can give it to you later he wrote a blog post where it says that the perceptrons contains all the essential ideas of machine learning still today from the algorithms to the theory it's all in there we well it's arguably i don't completely agree but it's it's uh it's an interesting observation okay so the idea is the same it's still the same today okay you have an algorithm that takes one could be more uh objects you apply the prediction if the prediction is correct you do nothing if the prediction is wrong, you correct the weights by doing something. In this case, it's by adding or subtracting the feature vector, but in general, it's, so this is still what learning in, in machine learning, even in the biggest neural networks does, is test your predictions and correct the weights to make it a little better. There's nothing else. That's what gradient descent does. So for simplicity, it's out. so this is the algorithm. It's very simple. You can write it down in a slide. So uh, you can even go through it very easily. So you initialize the weights at zero, and then you get some training example, say X, I, Y, I, you predict the output, you predict the output, call it, uh, call it Y, I, if the Y, I had, if Y, I is correct, if it's not correct, sorry, if it's wrong, then you, pre you correct, you, you update the weights by adding to the weights, the feature vector of the object for which the prediction was wrong. And you add it or subtract it depending on whether the correct y was plus one or minus one. So you add it or subtract it, depending on whether you want to make it more positive or more negative to be closer or further away from that example. And then you increment k and then you go on until uh, nothing changes, okay? And uh, not, not uh, Rosenblatt, but uh, a little later in 62, there was a, a, a theoretical result proved, which is goes like this. I will just very briefly sketch it. Uh, if the training data is linearly separable, it's possible to find a linear boundary that perfectly separates the such that uh, this is called the margin. Okay, such that in the worst case, points are further than gamma away from the boundary. Okay, that what this expression says is that uh, if you have the boundary and you have positive points on one side and say negative points on the other side, the closest point to the boundary is at least gamma. There are no points closer to, than gamma to the boundary, okay? If you can assume this, and if the radius of the data, what's the radius of the data is that how far, so for this is, oops, this is somewhere in, in, in some vector space, the norm of the biggest point, the point that's further away from the origin, okay? Then you can show that, the perceptron is guaranteed to find a separating hyperplane 
in at most after doing at most r2 divided by gamma two mistakes so it shows that it's more difficult if the data is very spread out okay and it's it's easier if the margin is big if the margin is big it means all the points are far away from the boundary then it's easy to find the boundary but if there are points that are very close to the boundary then it's more difficult it takes more mistakes to find the boundary okay this is a famous theorem it's uh, the perception theorem mistake bound by Novikov. this is 1962 61 years ago uh a very nice very nice and the proof is very simple i'm not going to go through the proof it's a one slide proof okay it's really nice it's really nice really elegant it uses like almost all proofs in mathematics well i'm exaggerating uh but like so many proofs in mathematics is based on the very 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 i cannot stress enough important inequality called the cauchy schwartz inequality which essentially says that uh the 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 inner product is less or equal than the product of the norms okay there's so many things in mathematics and machine learning that depend on the cauchy schwartz inequality but so many triangle inequality cauchy schwartz inequality there's there's little more than that and a few others okay so what can a simple perception do and do not so this was a discussion going around at the time if the problems are linearly separable say uh, those triangles versus the circles so if the, like if it was binary, suppose the features are binary, so it could do those three problems, but it famously could not do the exclusive or problem. So you cannot this this data set is not linearly separable. Okay, there are there's no straight line that you can put there that separates the circles from the triangles. Okay, although you could if you transform them. For example, that's an example in the in the next uh, in the next picture. So it cannot solve non-linearly separable problems. Okay, it would not convert. It would just keep on iterating forever. Uh, and although this result is attributed to Minsky and Papert in a famous book in '69, it was actually known before. So this is a very famous book that came out in '69. I sometimes have a slide about the winters of, of AI, and people just got really people after these really really enthusiastic uh, predictions that were saying that in a few years perceptrons will be building other perceptrons and talking to people so uh Minsky and Papert say no 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 it can't even solve the exclusive or problem what I what are you talking about uh and so this created a huge uh let's say depression in people working in AI it caused something called the AI winter there's been there's been more than one but this is the first AI winter and people sort of abandoned work in AI, especially in these neural network based uh, and AI. Okay, let's get into more uh, realistic problems, say multi class problems. Okay, let's now the infamous expression multi class means that we have more than two labels, we get two or more labels. There are many ways to reduce um, multi class problems to binary problems. Okay before we actually attack them as multi-class. So one of them is something called one versus all or OVA. What you do is the following. You have your data sets and you train a binary classifier to distinguish each class from all the other classes. Okay. So you train, if you have K classes, you train K binary classifiers. That is each one of them is, is specialized in distinguishing one class from all the others. Okay. And then when you have a new training a new sorry new test sample you you apply all these k classifiers they will give you scores for how much each one of them believes that it's that class and not the others and you choose the one with the highest score okay this is the one versus all approach there's the one versus one or ovu which in portuguese means egg um, in this case you train k times k minus one over two why k minus why k times k minus one over two it's the number of pairwise terms you have in k objects right for each of these k you can compare it with the other k minus one objects and you only need to do it in one direction so you don't need to train k times k minus one it's k minus one over two okay pairwise classifiers and then you do majority voting when you have a test you, you test it and you do which uh, which class wins the most comparisons and you decide for that there's even more sophisticated this was very popular in the early 2000s which is error correcting codes so what's what's an error correcting codes approach so an error correcting code approach to multi-class using binary is the following suppose you have say uh eight classes you can write the classes in binary say 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 
you could do this. And then you can train a binary classifier to learn how to predict each bit of this code. Okay. So you have three class, if you have eight classes, you only need three classifiers. But you can be try to be a bit uh, clever, more clever. And instead of three bits, you use four bits. For example, you add a, an error correcting bit. Say if you force the word to have, say, even parity or odd parity. And instead of the minimum, which for eight classes would be three bits, you train, you use four bits. Okay. And you get a bit of redundancy and you get a more robust classifier. This was, there's lots and lots of work on these error correcting codes approach to, to multi class classification for, from binary to reduce to binary. Okay. But here we will not do any of that. We will consider classifiers that tackle the multi class directly. Okay. So what changes? Now, instead of a weight vector, now we have a weight matrix, one weight per class, okay? One weight vector per class. And we don't have one bias term B, we have a vector of bias terms, one per class, okay? So equivalently, so this is a matrix, okay? It's K weight vectors uh, of dimension D and K scalars, uh, one per class, okay? So now the score of each class is a linear combination of the features. The features are always the same and, and their weight. So, the score for a given object is just W is just matrix W. I'm sorry. So W, uh, so this is little W. Okay, little W uh, Y transpose phi X plus BY is the score of class Y, okay? So this is what I was saying. So the, if you want to simply classify by choosing the, 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 the class that has the highest score, what you have to do is compute the score for each class, okay? You just compute the inner product of the corresponding vector with the feature vector plus the offset plus the bias, which can be written in a compact notation as multiplying the matrix by the feature vector, you get the vector of scores, well, with plus B, you get the vector of scores. And argmax there means, given a vector, finding where is the largest value in that vector, okay? This is uh, the argmax operation, which will come back a lot further on, okay? So what happens if you have more than two classes is that this kind of model splits the feature space into regions. And these regions are separated by hyperplanes. Actually, each of these regions uh, is an intersection of k minus one half spaces, okay? So you have a half space that's defined by one of the w's and the corresponding b, another one, another one, another one. You have lots, it chunks the space in, in, in pieces defined by half spaces. So it's still linear classifier, okay? So again, well, handcrafted or not handcrafted features doesn't matter if you have a linear classifier with more than two classes, the output of whatever the system is, it could be just that, or it could be a big neural network behind, it doesn't matter. It's just argmax of the weights. The weights are represented. So these connections here are just the weights, how, how strongly each feature connects to each class. It's there, that matrix W offsets or biases B. And, and you just compute that, you get a vector of scores, you find the maximum, that's the classifier. Okay, in two classes, of course, this recovers the binary classifier. Okay, notice that if we want to just find the maximum, between the two scores, you just need to compare one score with the other score and check if the score for class plus one is bigger than the score for class minus one. So this is the score for class plus one. This is the score for class minus one. You compare them. If it's one is bigger than the other, you decide for plus one and otherwise. So now you can actually simplify that comparison by moving the Ws, moving everything to the same side. Okay, because phi, you can put phi in evidence and you have W plus one minus W minus one in a product with phi, you could put phi in evidence, it's there and there. You can move the B minus one to the other side with a minus sign and you can write it like this. And now you have, you can call the difference between the two Ws simply W and the difference between the two B simply B and you recover the original thing that we had for binary case, which is sine of W transpose phi plus B, okay? And in fact, if you have a binary classifier, you only need, you don't need vectors for the two classes. You just need one vector. Although it's essentially what it does, what it represents is the difference of the vectors for the two classes. Uh, so again, this is a binary, that, this thing that we saw. It's also possible to run a perceptron algorithm for multi-class. 
Um, so it, it sort of looks very similar to the one before. Essentially, what you do is you do the prediction and then you increase the weight of the correct class if, if it's wrong. If your prediction is wrong, if it's correct, you do nothing. If it's wrong, you increase the weight of the correct class and you decrease the weights of all the other classes. Okay, essentially you're correcting, you're trying to make the trying to, to, to decrease the likelihood that this, this uh, mistake is repeated in the next, if you revisit the same point. Okay, I'm not going too much in the details of that. Okay, so reminder, this is what you have, linear classifier, it's written like this, final layer of whatever, or just itself with handcrafted features, argmax, so this matrix here. So if this, if what I put here is phi one, and what I put here is, phi d of x of some object x this first connection and if this is class one and if this is class uh, say two this weight here is w uh, one two and so on and this last one is w it's gone w uh, d two this one actually one one and d two okay so just those all these guys uh, just this matrix w okay what if we want probabilities and i will stop in maybe five or ten minutes what if we really insist on having probabilities not just i'm not happy with this just predicting the class using the sign uh, or using just a comparison and not knowing anything about the score not knowing anything about how probable it is that the class how confident i am that the class is this one okay so if we want class probabilities what we need is a way to map from, there's an M missing there, from K label score. So we have, remember, we have for each point X, we compute phi, we compute the inner product with Y, with some BY, which is the score. Let's call these ZY, okay? So we have for each class given a point, an object, oh, it's, it's hidden, oh, it's enough, ZY. So this Z, contains the scores Z1 to ZK of a given object, okay? And I want to transform these into probability distribution over the classes, okay? The scores are arbitrary numbers. This is in RK. These are just numbers, it can be anything, okay? And on the other side, you have something called the simplex, okay? I have it in another slide, but I'm gonna write it. Anyone knows why this is a triangle? why it's shown as a triangle. Okay, so this is, I want probability distributions are, this you should, I guess you know, let's call it just P. A P is just a vector of numbers, say P1 to P K, the vector of numbers with the following properties. So each one of them is larger or equal than zero because it's a probability. It cannot be less than zero, it's, there are no negative probabilities. And you know that if you add all the probabilities, how much do you get? One, okay? So there's a notation for this, the, the, the set of all the vectors P, such that PI is larger or equal than zero and sum of all the PIs is one, is often written, and this is I from, let me, I from one to K is often written as delta K minus one. Okay, it is called a simplex or probability simplex. It's a nice name. It looks like a washing machine or something. Yeah? Uh, easy to operate washing machine. Why is it K minus one? Why do I? Why don't we just write uh, delta K? Anyone has a clue? Yeah, because you only have K minus one degrees of freedom, okay? Because once you know K minus one numbers, you already know the last one because it's one minus the sum of the others. And why is it shown typically as a triangle and why was Delta chosen? So the reason why it's a triangle is not because it's usually called a Delta, it's the other way around, okay? Why is it usually shown as um, a triangle? Let me see, uh, space. Well, for this reason, suppose you are in three dimensions, Okay, let me try to, I'm not very good at hand drawing. I have this in the other slide, but suppose you are in three dimensions, say P1, P2, P3. 
what does the, the set of possible P's look like in this space? Can I be at the origin? Can I be at the origin? Can I have zero, zero, zero? No, I cannot, right? But I can be here, for example, if this is one, zero, zero, I can be here, okay? I can be here. If it's, uh, this is zero, one, zero, this, the first, this is, this one is zero, zero, one. This one is uh, zero, one, zero. And this one here is uh, one, zero, zero. Okay, though these three points are okay. Let me move these to another color. So where are the others? Now, if you think a bit, it, they fall on this, there's a plane here, they're in this surface there. Can you see it? Yeah. Which is this little triangle where all the, that contains all the points such that the three coordinates sum to one. And, it's, and they all need to be in the first quadrant. That's why, because in three dimensions, it is the first non-trivial case. In two dimensions, it's just a little line, okay? In three dimensions, it's a triangle. That's why it's usually represented as a triangle. And it's why it's usually used, uh, the letter that we use is a delta because a delta looks like a triangle. Okay, that's called a simplex. So a goal is we have a vector, we want to find the probability distribution. So a point in the simplex that corresponds to that vector. What do we mean by correspond? Okay, so many things, we'll come back to this, but intuitively we want something like this. The higher a given Z is, the higher the corresponding P also should be. Okay, that's the first thing. So I want to, I don't, I cannot do just any arbitrary mapping. It has to be something reasonable. Okay, there are several ways. Uh, well, one way is just look for the maximum possible Z and make P to be zero everywhere and the one at that position. That's okay. It's a probability distribution, but that's not what we want. Okay, we want something that preserves some information. Okay, so one thing that does that I'm going to stop maybe after this slide. Is so recap. So we know this. This is the score. I'm omitting B. B is inside. So phi has a one, and W has a W zero that contains all. So forget about the, the offset. Okay. So the classical way to do this is the following way. So to obtain the probabilities, you take the scores, you exponentiate them. So you have Z one. Let me move. You have Z1 to ZK. First thing you do is you exponentiate them. Exp of Z1, exp of ZK. What you gain from these, now they're all, regardless of what the Z's are, these are all larger or equal than zero. Exponentials are larger or equal than zero, but they don't still necessarily sum to one. What do we need to do next to make them sum to one? You divide by their sum. Right now, you take them all and divide by their sum. That's what it's done there. It's written there. So we exponentiate uh, each uh, component of the score. It's W Y transpose phi, and then you divide by the sum of these exponentials. And now you guarantee to have a collection of numbers that are larger or equal than zero and sum to one. Okay, and this is called the softmax transformation, exponentiation followed by normalization. It goes by many other names: maximum entropy. Logistic transformation, but let's call it softmax for now. I'll explain later why it's called softmax. We'll come back to that. So one very important property that we will use later on is what happens if you add a constant to all the scores? Suppose you have all the Zs, Z1 to Zk. You do these, and then you have Z1 plus alpha, Zk plus alpha. Does anything change? No, right? When you add, when you exponentiate, you add a constant to the exponential. It's like multiplying by the exponential of that. It appears in all of them. So it also appears in the sum. It cancels out, so it doesn't change. So the softmax transformation is invariant to the addition of a constant to all the scores. So it, seems, so it doesn't matter where the scores are. It just matter how they relate to each other, okay? It's still a linear classifier in the sense that you, if you want to find the class that has the highest probability, it's the same as finding the class with the highest score because the highest exponential is also the highest argument of the exponential. Exponential is a monotonic function. And a very important thing, and I will stop with this, the fact that you have probability probabilities and not just, this is a, looks like a very uh, sort of irrelevant sentence, but it's not. The fact that they have probabilities is very important in practice, okay? 
we don't necessarily want to select the class with the highest probability. Say that you want you're doing a medical diagnosis problem, and you have disease, you, the binary problem. You have say your machine that you built, and it's producing estimates of whether that the patient has or not a given disease. Okay. And you will not just select the most probable decision. You will you weight the consequences, okay? For, ex for a medical diagnosis, that's a classical example. The cost of making a false mistake, the making a mistake is different in, in both directions. A false positive has different consequences than a false negative, okay? And you can also only weight that, you can only do that, this formally if you know probabilities, class probabilities. You cannot do it if you just look for the maximum probability. Okay, and so this is, I won't go back into this, but it's very important to keep in mind that if you have probabilities, you can weight the consequences if you know the consequences of all the possible decisions. Okay, let's stop here. Let's go for coffee and we'll be back uh, at 11. Okay. Hello. You're all energized with the coffee? Let's use the caffeine for another 90 minutes. Okay, so let's go on. So we're looking at binary, at logistic regression. Now we're gonna just look at, very briefly at the particular case of the of binary classification. So if you have only two classes, say minus one plus one as usual. So it turns out that, uh, remember this idea that if you add a constant, I actually wrote it here somewhere. If you add a constant to all the scores, well, you remember. If you're in logistic regression, in the logistic transformation, so exponentiation followed by normalization. If you add a constant to all the scores, nothing changes, right? Because exponentials all get multiplied by a factor that cancels out. So this means that you can take one of the scores and arbitrarily set it to zero, right? If you have a lot of Zs, before exponentiating, you can put subtract one of them from all the others. You get one of them is zero, all the others are whatever the difference is. And it's the same. Well, after doing the exponentiation and normalization, nothing changes, okay? Which means that you can arbitrarily set one of the scores to zero and you only need the others. But in fact, you, don't, you never need K scores. You only need K minus one scores because you can make one of them zero. This is usually what uh, is argued when you, in the binary case, you say, okay, score for class minus one is zero and score for class one is uh, the score. Okay, whatever its score is. So you don't only need one. And so when you when you do this exponentiation, where's the pen? Exponentiation followed by normalization, one of the scores is zero. So exponential of zero is one. So you get one divided by one plus exponential of um after you divide, you divide everything by by exponential of uh, by, by the exponential, you get one over one plus exponential of minus the score. And this function is called uh, you've seen it before, I'm sure sigmoid or logistic transformation and it looks like this you've seen it before i'm sure uh, it's widely used in neural networks you'll see it, a lot of it tomorrow essentially it squashes a real number into zero one so essentially it takes a score which is an arbitrary number into zero one so it becomes it becomes uh, interpretable as a probability um, and it is positive this function it's bounded above and below by one and zero it's strictly increasing. So if you compute the derivative, the derivative is strictly larger than zero everywhere. And it's differentiable. Of course, it's, it's a, something with a, it's a quotient of exponentials. So it's differentiable. So it's all, all good. It's a really nice and uh, benign function that's easy to deal with. So how does it look in two dimensions? So if, you, if you're doing a, so again, keep in mind that uh, the axes, always keep in mind that the axes that I'm, I'm dealing in any of these plots, the axes are always something like phi one of X, not X one and phi two of X. So it's the components of the feature vector, not the objects themselves. They don't have any meaning. Okay, so the classifier would, would look something like this. So the boundary, so this is the probability, the boundary for this case would be something like here. Uh, blue is negative or blue is low, less than 0 0.5. 
red is uh, is really red is one. So this is basically one. This is basically zero. It's it's a bit dark. And if you look at it from a three D plot, it looks something like that. So where is the boundary? If you decide, if you decide uh, for the class which has uh, the highest probability, since you have two classes, the sum needs to be one. The the most probable class has cl has probability larger than one half because then the other has less than one half. And so the boundary, which is when one of the classes has probability one half, the other also has one half. It's, it corresponds to uh, the score being equal to zero because one half happens at zero. So this is one half. This is uh, when the line crosses the the one half threshold, okay? But if you're doing cost sensitive and you want to use another threshold because say you want to be more conservative or less conservative, you may use another threshold, uh, say tau, some number between zero and one. And in that case, uh, the, the, the boundary can be somewhere else, okay? You can put the boundary in some other, it's still a linear boundary, but it can be somewhere else, okay? This would be a less conservative decision. This would be a, a more conservative decision, okay? It's still linear. The boundaries are still linear anyway, okay? So this is what we have. We have, recall, we have a matrix of weights. So the weights for all the classes. So we have K weights, each one of them in D dimensions. So it's R K times D. And we know how to write the probability of each class, conditional probability of each class Y, given an object X, it's, well, it's it's hidden behind. Uh, that's what you were looking for. <laughs> okay, it's uh, exponential of the corresponding score divided by the sum of the exponential. So it's normalized. Question is, how do we learn the weights? How do we learn the weights from from data from a collection? Okay. So the solution is, remember, this is all we did for regression. We're gonna do exactly the same and in the regression and the Gaussian noise, it led to the least square solution. Now we're gonna do the same, but uh, it's, now it's more complicated because it's probabilities of labels. So what is typically done is this, you maximize, you write the conditional log likelihood, what is it? You sum across all the points in the training set, okay, the probability, of the label that you have seen, given that object, which depends on W, okay? So you're gonna, and this is because they're independent. You're assuming that the training set, the samples in the training set are all independent. That's why you compute the product of all these probabilities, okay? Then you're gonna try to maximize this with respect to W. Again, the, the idea, the rationale is the same as, as before. You're gonna look for W that makes the labels that you have observed more probable, okay? You're going to try to adjust the model to, to maximize the probability of what you have observed. That's why it's called likelihood. It makes the data more likely. You're looking for the model that makes the data more likely. Um, and again, the same, same tricks as before. You have a product. Log of a product is the sum of the logs. Okay. You can turn a maximization into a minimization by putting a minus behind. Okay. You have sum of logs of p's. And now we use this expression. Okay and put a log behind it, and let's see what happens. So the log, log of a quotient is the difference of the logs. Log of the numerator is easy because the numerator is exponential. Log of an exponential is just the exponent. So the log of this part ends up here. Okay, it's the exponent. And because there's a minus, it gets a minus there. So there's a minus that comes from there that goes there. Okay, and then the other part is the log of the denominator. There's nothing I can do. I just write the log of the denominator because the log of a sum, and there's nothing I can say about the log of a sum. Log of a sum is the log of a sum. Log of a product is the sum of the logs, but the log of the sum is the log of the sum. There's nothing I can do. So it's here. So this part is the log of the denominator in there. So, and now I want to minimize these with respect to, uh, to Ws, meaning, so remember that W contains all the Ws, all the Ws all the little w's for each class. So it's it's kind of clear what this is trying to do. So notice that the index here, the w that's being uh, at each data point, at each data point t, the w that I'm looking at is the w of the, of the class, of the correct class for that sample, okay? And since I'm trying to minimize this, 
I'm trying to make this guy small, meaning this guy large. Okay, I'm trying to make the score of the right label large. Okay, but of course I cannot just do that because I have uh, this condition that the scores, the probabilities need to be normalized. So there's also the other term, and so w, the W is appearing in the other term to all of them. Okay, but this is the essential part. The essential part of this objective is trying to make to choose W so that for each point the score of the correct class is high. Okay, that's that's all there is to it essentially. Okay, that's what's written in there. So W hat tries to assign as much probability as possible to the correct labels. Okay, there's constraints because they all compete. Okay, so how do we solve this problem? So this is an optimization problem. So let's look a little bit about at optimization. Okay, so the first thing that is important to notice is that this function, this function that we're trying to minimize, I'm trying to minimize a function, is a strictly convex function. What does that mean? So just to remind you about this math stuff. So we have functions. Functions can be non-convex, convex, strictly so, or convex, but not strictly so. Okay. I'm not going to write down the expression. It's not very important for us right now. So a, a function is convex. I'm sure most of you have seen this before, or many of you. If so it's just in one dimension, but in multiple dimensions, it would be the same. If given any two points on the function, okay, if I join those two points by a straight line, this line does not cross the graph of the function. Okay, in this case, I call this um, a non-convex function. If it crosses, it's non-convex. If it never crosses, no matter where I put the points, if I do a straight line, it doesn't cross the graph of the function. Then it's it's a it's a it's a convex function. It is strictly convex, okay. If, in addition to not crossing the graph of the function, it stays strictly above, okay, it does not touch the graph of the function except at the ends. At the ends, it has to because it starts there, okay. But in the middle, it does not touch the graph of the function. Then I say it's strictly convex. This function here on the right is convex, but it's not strictly. It doesn't cross, but it touches the graph of the function. So these two functions are the easiest to deal with. First of all, if you have a strictly convex function, the minimizer is unique. So it has a minimizer and it is unique. There's no, for example, this one has more than one minimizer. Okay, there's two minimizers. And a function that's not strictly convex also may have more than one minimizer. Think of this function like something function like this. That's flat, it's convex, but it has many minimizers. All of these points here are minimizers. Okay, so it's very good that it's a strictly convex function, okay? How do you show that the function is strictly convex? If the function is uh, differentiable, it is strictly convex if the second derivative is strictly positive, okay? You compute the function, you compute the first derivative, second derivative. If the second derivative is positive, strictly positive everywhere, strictly larger than zero, so its concavity is facing up, it is a strictly convex function. If it has zero somewhere, the second derivative, then it's not strictly convex. If it has negative values somewhere, then it's not even convex. Okay, so that's the way to do it. So if you want to try it, it's in many, you can find it in many places, but it's a nice um, derivative exercise. You can do it by hand. You can do it with Mathematica, or you can ask ChatGPT and it'll do it for you. Okay, so any local minimum is a global minimum. There's only one minimum, that's it. It's easy to, to deal with. It has no closed form solution. Yeah, if you look at these, you would hardly guess that you can solve it in closed form. Analytically, it cannot, right? It's a complicated function. Uh, and but so you can you need to use uh, numerical techniques, say gradient descent, conjugate gradient, quasi Newton methods. There's, there's a, in the especially in the early 2000s and late 90s, early 2000s, there was lots of work on efficient algorithms for logistic regression in large scale for large amount of data. I've worked on that myself, but it was like uh, almost 20 years ago. Okay, so just a recap of what gradient descent is, because this is at the core of all of modern learning, including, including deep learning. So gradient descent is this problem here. You have a function that you want from RD to R, say, for example, this logistic loss that we saw two slides ago. And you want to find its minimum. You want to, to minimize it. And suppose it's differentiable, okay? If it's not, it's more complicated, okay? So gradient descent, I'm sure many of you have seen this, is the idea that you can find the minimum by iterating, by taking small steps in the negative 
direction of the gradient. So the gradient of a function always points towards its uh, where it grows. If you go in the opposite direction, you go down. Uh, so uh, essentially, it looks like this. Okay. So on the left side, here I have an example where these are, these are level curves. Imagine a map seen from above, level curves of a function. This is the minimum is down there. This is the minimum. As, uh, so it's uh, different level curves of the function. And gradient descent, if you think a little bit about it, the gradient is always perpendicular to a level curve. Because if you go in along the direction of the level curve, you don't move. If you want to go down, if you've skied before, if you skied, you know that to go down fastest, you go in the opposite direction. You go on the gradient of the slope. If you go to the left or to the right, you're not going up or down. So gradient descent looks like this. It goes down perpendicular to the level curves of the function, which is in the direction of the gradient. And the step size is crucial, okay? You cannot just move any step size. Suppose you are here and you know, suppose you are here and you want to take the gra you know the gradient point in this direction. You cannot take any step size. If you take a too big a step size, you end up there. It is not what you want. Okay, you need to take small steps and finding the step sizes for gradient descent methods is in itself a, a huge research problem. So there's tons of papers on just even outside of machine learning, just as an optimization problem, finding the actual the ideal step sizes for, for uh, gradient descent methods is, is crucial. See, for example, in the upper uh, right plot on the right, this is an, a case where you have uh, large two large step sizes and you keep oscillating a lot okay and there are many many techniques for making a uh, gradient descent uh, faster and more efficient for example momentum which is something that uh, all these modern techniques that are using deep learning such as adam which you, you'll use uh, use which is it's essentially the same the idea that the, the point that is going down the function has mass so it kind of it's it's not easy to change direction. It has some momentum. It's going in some direction, so it it uh, it uh, will try to follow uh, in the direction where it was coming from. So it's not too sensitive to fluctuations of of the gradient. So if you add momentum, you can go from from having this very unstable behavior to a much more stable behavior. I will not go into the detail technical details of momentum because you will see that in in the labs. So. Gradient descent may work well or not. It depends on, on, on many problems, on how well conditioned the, the, the function is. Uh, and there are, it's, it's a whole research area. So how, in our case, we just want to see how do we apply it to logistic regression? How do I compute the gradient? Because for gradient descent, I need to compute the gradient. What does the gradient, what does the function look like? It looks like this, we had just seen it. Can we easily compute the gradient of this? Yes, we'll see in the next slide. If we can, then we just do, gradient descent. So we start at zero, and then we go down the gradient by computing the gradient of the loss and taking a step of size eta k in the negative direction of the gradient. And the first ob observation, the fundamental one, is that the gradient of the sum is the sum of the gradients, as you all know, because the derivative of the sum of functions is the sum of the derivatives. And so it's, I don't really, it's not, it's not very important that I have endpoints, as long as I can compute the gradient of each of the terms of the loss, then I'm, I'm, I'm able to implement these easily or not, okay? So the gradient that what I'm writing like, that, just to explain the notation, when I say gradient of L the, of WK, it means the gradient computed at WK, uh, where WK is the iterate, is the value, the estimate of W in iteration K, okay? So we know that the function is convex, okay? Actually, it's strictly convex. It has a unique global minimizer. And so we know that gradient descent with the adequate step size selection will converge to a global optimum. And so there's no worries about being stuck in global minima or anything like that, okay? An alternative, which is the more modern alternative, which is the one you actually need to use if you have a very large data set. Notice that if N is really large, if N is really large, this sum can be very expensive, okay? If you have a million data points, you compute the gradient of the loss with respect to each data point, and then you need to sum across all the million points. It's very expensive, okay? So one alternative that goes back to the 50s, in actually, is called stochastic gradient descent. And the idea is, is very simple. Instead of taking the whole sum of the gradients with respect of the loss for each data point, 
you just take one data point, okay? It sounds mysterious how this works, but it does. You take one data point, okay? You compute the gradient of the loss with respect only to that, that with respect to W, but only for the loss of that data point, and you take a negative, uh, a step in the negative direction of a gradient. Notice that it's very similar to the perceptron. The perceptron only updates looking at one point at a time, okay? So you look at the point, you you compute the law, you make the, the parameters a little better for that point, okay? And then you repeat by picking different points randomly, okay? So essentially you're approximating the gradient. I have a picture in the next slide that explains this idea um, by a noisy and biased version using a single sample. I, I'll show you, explain why, what I mean by that. There are variants, I'll go back to this. This is all guaranteed to find the optimal W if I select the step size correctly. So this step size selection, is a very crucial issue, okay? And uh, it's, it's still an open problem how to do it really correctly, okay? So this is a very nice, I can say it because I didn't do it myself, visual summary of how, what stochastic gradient descent means. So this is a figure, I don't know, anyone here knows Gabriel Peyre? You've heard his name? Oh, you do, great. So if you don't, I highly recommend that you follow Gabriel on Twitter. So every day he tweets, one of these pictures about some mathematical concepts. So this was, I use this a lot in my, in my life. So it's really useful, it's really elegant, it's really great, it captures the whole idea. So remember, we want to minimize a function. In, there's a lot of com complication here because it's a big, big sum, right? It's a big sum across all the points of some blah, 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 blah. But in the end, it's just a sum of functions, okay? all of them depending on say W, okay? And you know that to compute the gradient, you need to compute the average. Well, you can you can sum or average, you can absorb this one over N in the lambda, in the step size, it doesn't really matter. So this is the total gradient, it's the average of the gradients of each with respect to each point. So you can look at these little dashed lines as the average, as the, 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 the gradient of each of the, with respect to each of the points, of which the average gives you the total gradient, which is the one in, in solid, okay? And what you're doing is replacing what you would really like to do, which is compute the whole gradient, by replacing them by individual components of that average, okay? Notice that it's unbiased in expectation. The expected value of these gradients is the other one, because if you select randomly, on average, you would get the sum of all of them divided by the total, which is exactly what you want to minimize, okay? So it's, that's why it's called an unbiased, it's a noisy but unbiased version, okay? And, and on the right side, it's, if this was, if you, instead of just a finite sum, you have a sample, if you have like a probability distribution, and in that case, the gradient that you want to minimize, the gradient that you want to descend is the expected value of gradients, and you're just sampling, but it, we, we, we're on the left side, on the finite sum case. And there's a theorem, this is uh, Robbins, this algorithm is actually called the Robbins-Monroe Al Monroe algorithm. It was, it's from 50, nine, I think, or 58. Uh, and it shows that if F is strongly convex, then actually you go down, you, do, you convert to the minimum uh, at the rate of one over K. So the, 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 the square of the norm of the difference between the minimum and the iterates goes down as one over K, it goes down sublinearly. So I, I, you have the slide so you can, you can follow Gabriel later on. Okay, so there's another alternative, which sometimes works better, which is instead of using a single sample, so it's somewhere between full batch, taking the whole data set or taking just one sample, which is why not take 10 samples instead of what, just one. It's called mini batch, it's used all the time. Uh, and the idea is that instead of sampling just one point, you sample a subset of the data set, say B, a subset B, which is a subset of, of, of the big one to n data set and then you average the gradients only on that data set okay rather than taking one point you take b points and you average the gradient what happens is that whereas this would be so the blue line would be batch which is a whole data the purple line the one below this one here uh is stochastic gradient descent with a single sample it's really noisy it's like a drunken walk around because it's you're looking at just one point at a time and by averaging over a few points, you're somewhere in between. It's not as smooth as the whole batch that can compute the whole gradient. It's not as noisy as as, as purely stochastic uh, sample by sample. It's some something in the, in the middle. Of course, there's a trade-off. The, the the bigger B is, the more expensive each step is. So there's a trade-off. You take fewer steps, 
the bigger BEs typically take fewer steps, but the steps are more expensive, okay? Because you need to average over more points. So, okay, so how do we compute the gradient, okay? So let's see, so um, we need to compute the gradient of the log likelihoods of, of, the, of the logistic loss. Uh, it, it's, it looks a bit daunting, but it, it's not, it's quite, it's quite easy. It will be a sort of, it will look complicated, but if, uh, if we go step by step, it's very easy. We only need two properties of, of derivatives or of gradients, which is that, those two. You know that the derivative of the log is uh, one over the function times the derivative of the function. You all know this, right? You know that d d u of log of g of u is one over g of u times g prime of u, right? You all know this. And the other one is that the derivative of the exponential is the exponential itself times the derivative of, the ex of what's inside the exponential. You all know this, I'm sure, okay? And in the <clears throat> derivation, we'll use this that we already saw, the one hot vector representation of class Y. So we'll use this, this vector EY, which is a K-dimensional vector um, that has a one in position, in the position of the label of each sample and zeros everywhere else. And here we go. Okay, let's compute the gradient of these. So I'm computing the gradient with, for one point, okay? For the loss, for only one point, say an arbitrary point x, y, okay? And then if I want, if I do stochastic gradient descent, I do these for each point. If I want batch, I need to sum these across all the data set, okay? So first thing is, which you all know, is that the gradient of a sum is the sum of the gradients. So, right, you can move the gradients next to each of those terms, okay? Now, when we compute it, what, what, what do you mean by computing the gradient? Oops, ah, come on, okay. What do I mean here by computing the gradient with respect to, remember that the whole matrix, the matrix W contains W1, W2, all the Ws for all the classes. When I'm computing the gradient with respect to the whole matrix of an inner product, okay, inner product of one of these Ws with something, the gradient only looks at this wy. It doesn't look at the others because this part, this term does not depend on the other w's. It just depends on one of the vector w's. And what and what is and so and I'm sure that you know what is the gradient with respect to u of some u transpose some vector c. What is the result of this? Gradient of an inner product of a vector with another vector. It's c. Right, the gradient of a in the product of a vector with another vector is just the other vector. Okay? It's like the gradient of A times X is just A. Okay? It's just a generalization of this. So this term here is just when I go from here to here, first of all, I only look at WY because that's only that's all that's there. And the great it's just the gradient of an inner product, which is just the other vector, but the other vector is just phi. It's transposed because of the way the, the vectors are arranged. It would take a bit of time to, to express that, but that's not so, it's not very important. And the other, the other one is the gradient of a log. You see, gradient of a log is one over the function, A it is, times the gradient of the function. There you go. But the gradient of the function is the gradient of an exponential is just the exponent times what's inside. So I've, I've simplified these here just to these, okay? And now it's the gradient of an exponent is the, exp the gradient of an exponential is the exponential itself times the gradient of what's inside. And again, this is exactly as it was as this here. It's just the gradient of, with respect to the whole matrix of one of the inner products, you just get the, uh, the other element in the inner product, this. There you go. It's getting nice. So now if you look at these, what does this look like? Okay. This guy here, is just the softmax transformation at component y. It's just exponential of the score for class y normalized, okay? So this is just the probability that of y, of y prime, given x. There we go, probability of y prime given x. Okay, it's starting to look nice. And then I have these phi, transpose on the right, which I can put in evidence. 
And so I can write these in this form, in the explicit form. Okay. So I'm sure that this is a lot to swallow in one take. Uh, if you have not seen this before, but you can you can look at it later. I think this kind of thing that it's good to have seen once in your life. You don't need to do this very often. But it kind of captures everything that's going on with the gradient. So what the gradient is trying to do is remember, notice what is what is in this in this vector. It is the for the current W, what is the probability of each of the classes? What is the probability that so the first component would be probability and the W of class one given X. And down here, it's probability and the W of class uh, K given X. And this guy here, this EW has zero, zero, one, zero, 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 where this is the correct class. One is in correct class position. So what this is doing is when I'm going, and when I'm decreasing this, I'm trying to make the difference between the assigned probabilities for the classes and what I would really like that to be, which is zero, 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 one in the right position, zero everywhere. I'm trying to make this difference small. I'm trying to make the posterior prob the probabilities of the classes be as close as possible to this, which is what I would like it to be, which is be right, be say, okay, it's class number three, okay? So this gives the intuition of what the gradient of the, of the, of the, um, Logistic loss actually does. It's trying to, to make the, the machine agree with the labels that are given in the training set. Okay. So in summary, what do we do? We know how to compute the probability of each class given uh, the, the object X. We maximize the probability of the actual observed labels with respect to the weights of the, of the classifier. And we know how to compute the gradient. We saw it in the previous slide. So now we can just do gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent or mini batch gradient descent or whatever. Okay, we have all the tools that we need. So the key thing is that we know how to compute the gradient. So this is the, always the question. Is it differentiable? Can I compute the gradient? Okay. So what you have seen so far now, it's we've seen logistic regression. It's a discriminative technique. What we mean by discriminative technique is a technique that does not attempt to model distribution of X, it only attempts to model the distribution of Y given X. So how to discriminate different Ys for a given X, okay? Because it maximizes conditional likelihood, not the total likelihood. It, all, it goes by different names also, as I mentioned it before. It has no closed form solution. It can go down. It can be solved by, by going down the gradient using stochastic gradient descent or, or batch gradient descent. Remember how the perceptron updates look like? They look like this. So in the perceptron update, Every time I make a mistake, I update the weights by correcting with that difference. So the EY file, so this guy here is the score for the correct class. This guy is the score for the predicted class. If they are the same, there's no correction. Okay. If they are different, I correct in that direction. Now compare these with the expression above. Apart from the, forget about the, the step size, but it looks exactly the same. So this is already there. Okay, and this is different, okay? Whereas these, I'm only going, I'm only decreasing the weight. I'm only decreasing the weight in such a way that I will make the class that was predicted wrongly less likely. Here, I look at all the classes. It's an average prediction of all the scores for all the classes weighted. So it's like from here to here, I just keep the predicted class. Anyway, in logistic, I use the average across all the classes in the perceptron algorithm. I just use the class that was predicted. So it's slightly different, but in spirit, it's essentially the same. Okay, so they look similar in this sense. In spirit, they are, they are same. They're not exactly the same. Okay, let's look at another way of learning. Um, of le I, I'll go a bit fast here because, and I'll explain why I'll go fast because I want to cover other stuff, which is more important. Support vector machines was a very, very popular technique in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and the idea is, is, is the following. Instead of trying to look for probabilistic formulation like we have been doing now, I'm gonna look for a margin. So let, let me draw a picture that kind of, I like to draw it, it's, it's, it's suppose you have points from two different classes.
And I remember now I, I draw a boundary. Okay, suppose I draw this boundary. Okay. What is the margin? Remember what the margin was? The margin is the distance between the closest point to the boundary. Okay, from one side or from the other. Okay. So the bound the best boundary is always such that the closest point to one side and to the other side is the same. If I move the boundary closer to one point or closer to the other, the minimum of the two will decrease. Okay. So if I can if I can put the boundary wherever I want, it will be necessarily in such a position that the closest point on one side and the closest point on the other side will be at the same distance. Okay. So now I, the idea is that okay, is this a good boundary? Yeah, it's okay. Is this, for example, a good boundary? Not so good, right? The margin is smaller. Is this a better boundary? Yeah, it is. It, the margin is bigger, okay? So how do I formalize this idea that if I have a training set with points from two classes or from K classes, I should choose the boundary that has the highest margin? Easy, okay? It's like that. I want to maximize gamma. What is gamma? Gamma is this distance, okay? I want to maximize gamma. And how do I specify that gamma is the boundary, is the margin, like this? What, what, is, what is written in there is that the score, what is this? Oops, right. Let me erase this. So this is the score. This is the score of the correct class, okay? And this is the score of all the other classes. So for each Y prime, it's a score of a different class. And I want this difference between the score of the correct class and all the other scores of the other classes, including itself, because this, the difference with respect to itself is just zero. To be, la to be larger, or, this is for, that's missing, for any Y prime different from, YT. I want this difference between the score of the correct class and the scores of all the other classes to be at least gamma, larger or equal than gamma for all points and for all uh, wrong labels. Okay. And now I want to, I want to maximize the, the, the margin and I'm going to constrain the norm of U to be equal to one because it's trivial to maximize the margin in this sense, yes, I'm multiplying all the u's by some number. If I multiply all the u's, all these u's by alpha, the margin grows by alpha. And that's not what I want. I just want to find the direction. I don't care about the, the, the value. I just care about the direction. So I say, okay, let's keep the norm of u equal to one. Let's impose, this is different from yt. I need to correct this. And so this, uh, if, if the data set is, separate, is separable, I can achieve zero training error because of this hard constraint here. Okay, that's good. So fix u equal to one since increasing u would trivially produce large margins. I don't want to spend a lot of time in here. So now there's a trick, which is let's rewrite this in a different way. Okay, instead of fixing u to be equal to norm of u to be equal to one, I fix the margin to be equal to one. I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna insist on that the margin is at least one, okay? And then I'm gonna choose W and I'm gonna rescale. This is equivalent to saying, I'm gonna rescale W by saying it's U over gamma, okay? And I'm gonna maximize with or minimize with respect to, to W. But since U as norm fixed, fixed norm equal to one, minimizing W is the same as, as, as uh, maximizing gamma, okay? And so, I can show that this is equal, these two problems are equivalent. I know this is going fast. It's not very clear. I just want to, to, to end up with this problem. So, okay. So the, the problem of finding the best separating hyperplane in this sense of the margin is equivalent to solving this problem on the right. Minimizing, finding W, same matrix as before, as in logistic regression, one W per class, minimizing the norm squared, so the sum of all the squares, but subject to, for every point, I have margin larger or equal than one. 
Okay. Now this is the problem. It's called the quadratic problem. Why is it called the quadratic program? Quadratic problem or quadratic programming problem. The objective is quadratic. Okay. And the restrictions are linear. Okay. This is all with respect to W, these are all linear restrictions. I won't go into the details at all about how this is solved, just to know that it, it is possible to solve. Okay, what if the data is not separable? Okay, this is very nice. If I can insist on that every point should be on the right side of the boundary, at least at the given margin. Well, what we do is we introduce slack. A slack is a, a permission to not satisfy a condition. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a violation. And the, the slack, what it does is it allows this, so remember we have these criterion here. This was not here. This was not here. I insisted that the margin was larger or equal than one. Now I'm going to allow the margin to be violated by some amount. It's going to be, oh, okay. It doesn't have to be one. It could be one minus something. Okay. This something is positive, it's some little quantity. Okay. But I'm going to penalize, I'm going to penalize the amount of violation. Okay, so I'm going to allow some points to violate the margin, but I'm going to make them pay for that. Okay, and so I have this optimization problem that involves both. So minimizing W corresponds to maximizing the margin, and the other term means minimizing the amount of violations of the of these. Okay, so there's a trade-off between C, and if you have a large C, you you penalize the, the violations a lot. So you have more correctly classified points, but smaller margin, it's like overfitting in a sense, and, and vice versa. So if the data is separable, you can actually solve it with no violations. And so this problem also solves the problem where the data is separable. Okay, now there's a, a set of steps that I'm gonna jump over, I'm not gonna do it, okay? Because it's it's really boring and it's the kind of thing that you don't want to do on, on slides that you're seeing, you can want to do a slide that you're reading, which is showing that this problem can be written in a different way, which I'll jump. It's actually easy to understand what's going on, which is this form down there, okay? Uh, it's, this is equivalent to an empirical risk minimization problem where you just sum a loss across all the points, but now the loss looks like this, okay? It looks like you take the maximum of the scores of all the wrong labels, and you subtract it from the score of the right label, okay? And you want to make these small, okay? Because you don't want, you want to make these as small as possible, and you want to make these as large as possible. That's all, okay? So you want to make these differences as large as possible, okay? And this looks like this, okay? So the, the function that you're minimizing in the binary case is that green function there, okay? If you look at the margin, the horizontal axis is the margin for each point, is how far that point is from the boundary, okay? And you pay zero if you are at least one unit away from the boundary on the right direction, okay? And if you are less than one unit away from the boundary, you start paying and you pay more and more. When you cross zero, you cross the boundary, you're now in the wrong side of the boundary, and the more you penetrate on the wrong side of the hyperspace, the more you pay, okay? And the more, for each point, and the more you pay, it, it goes linearly. In contrast, you see that the blue line there is the logistic loss, which is the thing you would be minimizing if you're doing logistic regression. It behaves differently. So notice, for example, here, in this part here, it's very different. Whereas the logistic regression loss, the logistic loss, even for points that are correctly classified, it will still try to push them in the further away from the boundary because it always gets something by moving to the right. The other one does not, it doesn't care. As long as a point is more than one away from the boundary on the right side, it doesn't care, it can be anywhere, it doesn't matter, okay? And the red line is the, is the, the zero one loss. You could think naively that, why do I need all of these? Why don't I just minimize the problem taking as objective function, how many points are wrongly classified, okay? There's lots of reasons why you cannot do that. You can take a training set, you define a classifier with W and C, and you now you just count for that W how many points are wrongly classified. If you look at the function, there's a reasons, several reasons why you cannot do that. It's not differentiable. 
It's not even, it's not convex. It's not even continuous. Okay. There's no way you can easily minimize the problem. Actually, it can be shown that it's NP-hard. It's a very complicated problem to solve. So that's why you need these. So logistic loss, hinge loss can be seen as continuous and differentiable approximations to the real function that you would really like to minimize, which is the zero one loss, which is how many errors you make. But that one you cannot for computational reasons, okay? Until you use those. Okay, so the this is what I wanted to say about the hinge loss. Now, there's a problem with the hinge loss. Notice, if you look here, the function is not differentiable at that point. Derivative on the right is zero, derivative on the left minus one, so derivative at one does not exist, okay? So if you're there, you know, we don't know what, how to compute the gradient at those points. So you cannot directly use gradient descent, but well, you cannot, but you can use something else called subgradient descent. Let's see very quickly what a subgradient is. Who knows what a subgradient is? No one? Not a single person knows what a subgradient is? Yeah, great, so I can explain. Okay, a subgradient is a very simple general, it's very easy, a very easy idea. So it's a simple generalization of the idea of a gradient. You know what a gradient is. Let's think about one, di one dimension. Gradient is just the derivative, right? So the derivative, if you have a differentiable function, the derivative is just, uh, the function is differentiable there, the derivative is just the slope of the tangent, right? And if the function is convex, a tangent is a straight line that stays under the function. The function is convex, concavity is facing up, a tangent stays below the function, for sure, right? Otherwise the function will not be convex. So now take a point where the function is not differentiable. It has some little kink there, okay? So a subgradient in this case is the, the slope of any straight line, of any tangent that stays below the function. But since the function is not differentiable there, there are many. These, all these slopes, all these slopes give you straight lines that stay below the function. Okay, and any of these slopes is called a subgradient of the function. Okay, and all of them are okay in this sense. And the collection of all the subgradients is called a subdifferential. Okay, so differential is a set. So it's defined for convex functions. Any function has subgradients everywhere. In a place where it is differentiable, the subgradient is just a gradient. So it's obvious. And at points where it's not differentiable, there are infinitely many subgradients. Actually, it's usually an interval. So for example, here, if this was the slope of the tangent from this side, and this was the slope of the tangent from this side, any slope between the two is a correct subdifferential subgradient. And so the subdifferential is the interval of all those slopes. Okay, so that's what I was saying. So for example, let's now look at the hinge loss. So the hinge loss looks like this. Remember? Okay. So what is the gradient to the left of one? What is the derivative of this function to the left before to the left of one? To the left of one, minus one. To the right of one, zero. At one. It's anything between zero and one. It's an interval between zero and one. Okay, so this is it. So the subgradients at the left of one is minus one, to the right of one is zero. At one is anything between minus one and zero. Because if you draw tangents here, if you draw tangents that stay below the function, any tangent with a slope between zero and one will, will be okay. Okay, so you can take it to be zero. Why not? It's easy, it's a good number. And so what we see is that the subgradient of the hinge is just zero for some, if you have some function, if F is the hinge applied to some function, and if G is differentiable, then a valid choice is just is zero if this function is larger or equal than one, and it's minus G, minus the gradient of G if it's less than one. So it's, it turns out to be very benign. And so what happened is that if you'd want to do gradient descent, it's just that, it's just you take the weights, well, there's a problem with this, I'll correct it. You just gradient descent is that, what is this here? This condition is that you're satisfying the margin. Say the correct label, the difference between the correct label, the score of the correct label and the score of the, all the other labels is larger or equal than one. If this is the case, it means that that point 
the classifier for that point is classifying it with margin above one. So I'm not gonna touch anything. I don't change the weights. Otherwise, I'll just do this, which is very similar to what we had for the, it's exactly the same or almost exactly the same as for the perceptron algorithm. It's just computing the difference between the correct, uh, this is the predicted label, this is the correct label. You just predict, you just correct in that by taking the difference between these two scores, uh, be between these two feature vectors, okay? You can look at it in detail. But the, the thing is, it's very easy to do subgrade descent for the SVM, uh, for the for the support vector machine. And actually what we can, we can write down the, the perceptron update in a similar way, just with the gamma equal to one. And it looks exactly the same, okay? It's a slight difference here is that for the perceptron, you don't, the, the only difference is that in the perceptron, you just care if the point is well classified or wrongly classified. In the SVM, you insist on having a margin larger than one. It's the only difference, okay? Which means that the perceptron, what it's doing, is minimizing a loss function, which is not, it's the hinge. It looks like the hinge, but it's with no margin. It's like this. So it's a reverse ReLU. Actually, this is a ReLU of, of the, with the argument switched, okay? To rectify the near unit. Okay. Next chapter, sparse max. What is sparse max? Remember this problem. We talked about this. How do we obtain probabilities? Remember this problem, we have whatever machine, could be a deep narrow network, could be just a linear thing that produces scores. And I want to map the scores into the simplex, probability distributions. You've seen this. You've seen how to do this with logistic transformation. We just take the components of Z, exponentiate them, divide by the sum, done. Okay? There are other ways to do it. Okay? So the mappings that we need, that we want need to satisfy some conditions. I told you that we were going to look more carefully at what conditions does this mapping need to satisfy. The one we saw was this, actually used it, is that the mapping is such that if I add a constant to all the Zs, the mapping does not change, right? We saw this for the logistic because if I add alpha to all the exponents, it's the same as multiplying all the exponentials by exponential of alpha. So when I normalize, it just goes away, okay? So that is okay. The other thing is that it should be permutation invariant. Sorry, permutation equivariant, okay? If I take position number three in Z and position number seven and switch them, the same should happen to the corresponding piece, okay? So which means that if I, for some permute, let's P sub some permutation matrix that permutes the components of a vector, this transformation applied Transformation applied to the permutation of Z should be the same as the transformation applied to Z and then the permutation computed afterwards. The permutations should uh, commute with, with, uh, with the application of the mapping. And finally, and this is absolutely crucial, it should be monotonic, okay? You want that uh, the classes that have the higher scores to also have the higher probabilities. So if, if class I has score larger or equal than class J, then the probability of class I should also be larger or equal than the probability of class J. It should be a monotonic transformation in this sense, okay? So we already saw that softmax does this. So why does this? Why does it do this? For obvious reasons. The first one we already saw. The second one is obvious because if we permute the Zs, we also permute the corresponding Ps. Normalization is the same for all of them. And the last one, it's also clear because it's an exponential function. An exponential is monotonic. The normalization is the same for all of them. And if Z1 is larger than Z2, exponential of Z1 is larger than exponential of Z2, okay? So softmax satisfies all of these. But there are other things that do, okay? So this is softmax, we already saw it satisfies. It underlies logistic regression. The results have full support. So because they're exponentials, they have all these uh, property that all of the components of softmax are strictly larger than zero. So when you, run some algorithm, some method that produces class probabilities, you always get non-zero probabilities for all the classes. So it's really small for some, but they're all non-zero, okay? This is a disadvantage if you want some sparse distribution, if you want to say only focus on the classes that are most probable in an adaptive way, because you could always do it, okay, let's just keep the three more probable, but that's not adaptive, that's fixed. Maybe I want the, 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 the method itself to select how many to keep, how many are relevant. Okay, 
And the common workaround is to take these and then thresholds, like okay, let's keep only probabilities above some number and then renormalize. But that's very, but that's very um, ad hoc. Okay, so the alternative, which was actually uh, proposed by by Andre Martin, she was down there, in, uh, my colleague and former student, and uh, and uh, Ramon Astudillo is somewhere around there again, not here. A few years ago, is something called sparse max. Actually, this goes this as a, a deeper theory, but the, the the idea is very simple. So the idea is that remember, you want to go from arbitrary vectors in k dimensions to a simplex. And one way you can do is just do an Euclidean projection. You take the points and project. What, what do you mean by computing an Euclidean projection? So in, in three dimensions, you could do this. So you have the simplex, you have some point Z somewhere. Euclidean projection is just finding the point on the simplex that's closest to the point Z in, in Euclidean distance, that's all. Okay, so that's what's written in there. You want to find the point on the simplex that minimizes the distance from Z. Okay, so now this has very interesting properties, which for example, could be like this. If you are here, for example, if Z is here, it can happen that the projection is on one of the corners. Okay, and if you write at one of the corners, for example, this corner here is zero, one, zero. Okay, it is automatically sparse. You don't need to threshold or anything. Okay, it depends on where you are. Okay, so the projection can happen at the boundary, one of the corners or one of the sides of the simplex. If it's one of the sides, then the, some other component is zero. Okay, so in the case of sparse max, it, it, it has zeros. But it retains a lot of, of the properties of soft max, namely differentiability. Can, you can still do gradient descent. It can be computed efficiently. So this projection, uh, the softmax is very easy to compute. Remember, exponentiate and normalize. Projection is a bit more complicated. It requires sorting the components of Z first, which costs uh, K log K, number of classes. So it's a bit more expensive, but it's not that much. So essentially it boils down to sorting and then shifting and thresholding. I won't go into that. So in the binary case, how does it look like? Okay, so suppose we have two classes, one and two, and our scores is Z and T and zero. Remember that we can make one of the scores zero. It doesn't change anything. So that's, I'm, I'm say, just saying that one of the scores is zero and the other is T, and T is the score for class one. Okay, so, and now if in the softmax case, it looks like this, we know it looks like, in the sparse max case, it looks like this, okay? So it's kind of a logistic transformation. It's kind of a sigmoid, but it's a hard sigmoid. It's zero up to a point, then it's linear, then it's one beyond that point, okay? So it's sort of a hardened version of the sigmoid. This is kind of a piecewise linear version of the sigmoid, okay? You can also do it in, in for three classes. You can make one of the classes score zero, the other two are T1 and T2. It's kind of, you see, it's always a piecewise linear function. It's piecewise planar. Uh, kind of function, okay? So for example, let me show just a, an example with numbers. So if, if we have these scores on the left, so 1.07 minus 1.1, blah, 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 all this, those, those blue scores, okay? Um, actually, they were they are shifted up to, to become more positive. I, I, we added, I don't know, minus 1.1 or minus 1.5 or something, 1.5 to all of them. So it's all above zero, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter I can shift all those five numbers up and down and the result does not change, okay? So argmax would correspond to selecting only the most probable, which is the first one, putting all the mass there and zero for the others. Sparse max selects the two most probable and keeps only those such that the sum of the probabilities is one. So it's a projection on the simplex. Now, this may be, um, this is sparse but differentiable. It's very common and in, in, days, in these days also in, in large language models, there's a lot of talk about temperature, what we mean by temperature. The, these, these systems, this model, these transformations can be changed by including something called a temperature parameter. What's a temperature parameter? Why, it's called, why is it called temperature? The idea is very simple. You take the argument of the function and divide by T. 
Okay. The reason why this is called the temperature is because in, in statistical physics, the distributions also have this parameter one over T, exactly like that, that control the behavior of the distribution. Then it's called the temperature. But here it will be, I hope it will be clear why it's called the temperature. What happens when you do this? Okay. So remember, think of think of softmax. Think of this. Blah 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 blah. Sorry. Think of this. Now divide all the elements all the arguments by T, everything has to be divided by T. What happens if T goes to infinity? What happens if you have exponential of Z I divided by T? What happens when T goes to infinity? What happens to this? It goes to exponential of zero, right? So what happened? They all go to one. And so the, 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 the denominator goes to K, okay? So where does this distribution go to when I let, so if I divide by T and I take the limit as T goes to infinity, what is the result? One over K, one over K, uniform distribution, okay? Right? Okay. So what happens if T goes to zero? It's more difficult. Any idea? If T goes to zero, right? They all grow because it's exponential of Z divided by T. T is going to zero. So Z over T is going to infinity. But which one is going faster? The largest one. And it's always normalized. Yeah. You get arguments back. Exactly. So, and the same. Now, let, let's look at uh, where was the picture? Here. What happens when Z, when I take some Z and divide by T? What happens when T goes to infinity? Where does Z go to? To the origin. And what's the projection of the origin on the simplex? Is the center of the simplex uniform distribution. So the same happens here, okay? And uh, and again, when, what happens when T goes to zero? Z goes very far away, and it, the projection will be the closest corner of the simplex, okay? Again, argmax. So this we can be shown formally, but I will not do it. I just, in, so I just wanted to give you the intuition. So the zero temperature limit, that's why it's, it's kind of freezing, right? Both the softmax and the sparse max converge to argmax, okay? And in the high temperature limit, both the softmax and the sparse max converge to the uniform distribution, okay? So by controlling the temperature, you control how, how much, how peaked the, 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 the distribution is, both for sparse max and softmax. And for the case of sparse max, how sparse it is, okay? So if T goes to zero, sparse max is just argmax, if, and it becomes more, uh, more less sparse if you make if you lower the temperature if you increase the temperature okay what about loss functions how do we train a model such that when the last layer is not soft max but but uh, but sparse max so remember how we did it for how we did it for for um, for um, logistic loss okay remember it was like this classifier estimates the class probability we compute minus the log of the probability, which is minus log of the softmax computed for that guy. And then we, which when we write the softmax in its form and then we expand, we get uh, the log, the, the loss. But the key thing is that we have this minus log here so that we can add the, the terms for each point, okay? And ZC is the score for class C, it's just that, okay? Now, now can we do this for sparse max? Can we use the same strategy? We could use, the same thing here, instead of soft max, can we put sparse max here? What could go wrong? Zero logarithms of zero, logarithms of zeros, because sparse, sparse max can give you zeros and you cannot compute logs of zeros. It would give you minus infinity. Actually, it should give you infinity because it's minus log. 
So because you're not, if you were sure, if you could be sure that in the training set, all the labels, when the probability, the corresponding probability of sparse max was computed would never be zero, then this would not, but you can never be sure of that. So you cannot use this technique directly with sparse max. So let's try to engineer uh, something. So the loss gradient for, for, for uh, we saw this before. So for uh, logistic loss, it looks like this. It's just the difference between the, the feature vector for the correct class and the the probability of that of the of the what the, the the all the the probabilities that the that the softmax is giving you for all the classes multiplied by the corresponding by again by the same feature vector. Could you obtain something similar? Okay, we cannot do this because of log of zero. What can we do? Let's do the same. Try to follow the same strategy. We would like to compute the estimate of the probabilities now using sparse max, and we would like. The gradient, I have this, they look the same, right? To go from this one, that's just, just a correction. We, we can actually take this guy from here and here and put it here, right? And this is just the difference between, remember that EY is just an indicator of 000, correct class 000, and the other guy is just the probabilities. I'm just looking at the probability, the difference between the correct, what I would like, which is all zeros, one, all zeros, and the current estimate of the probability is that difference. I would like to do the same for sparse max. So have a gradient that looks the same. That would be great, okay? And it turns out that it can be achieved if I use that, that loss. I'm not gonna explain why. You'll have to read the paper if you want, but it's possible. And it's differentiable and it's convex and it's all good, okay? You can still do gradient descent on this. And there's code to do it. You can download it and use it. Okay, just a summary. So these are the, remember when I showed the hinge loss, and so this is actually turned the, the other way around. This is, this is a margin going in that direction rather than the other, but it doesn't matter. So look at the, the difference. So the hinge, we've seen the hinge is for this SVM is this one. The zero one loss is the red one. The logistic is the blue that we've seen before. The square there doesn't matter for now, but the sparse mark is the green line, right? It looks a bit like the hinge here on this side. It's flat when you are more than one away from the boundary, but now it's smooth here. Okay, it's almost like a quadratic function. And then it grows linearly like the hinge again. So it's kind of a, a mixture of all of these together um, and it's differentiable and it's convex. And so it's easy to use, okay. Penultimate chapter, regularization. So we've seen this before, you've seen this picture before. If a model is too complex, it has too many parameters, there's a risk of overfitting. This is the example we saw um, with the polynomial regression. It's of course a toy picture, it's not a real picture. I'll show you a real picture in a second. And we already saw an example of this when we did polynomial regression. The idea that maybe just a straight line is too, is too simple because it doesn't capture the behavior of the function like a quadratic was seemed to be okay in this time prediction example. And if you have a too high order of the polynomial, you may, you run the risk of overfitting, okay? So regularization is a way of preventing these, which we already touched upon. I showed you an example for regression, which amounts to taking the empirical risk. So this is, remember, this is the empirical risk, the sum of the loss functions for all the training points. You add a function that penalizes somehow choices of W that are large. You try to keep the, the size of the parameters small. So this omega of W is usually called the regularization function. Its weight is usually called the regularization parameter. Okay. And classical choices, we already saw one of them, are so-called L2 regularization. It's called L2 because this is called an L2 norm, uh, which is equivalent to a Gaussian prior. Well, I mentioned that, although I didn't go into the details. Um, it's just the sum of the squares of all the comp of all the weights. That's all. Okay. So when you when you add these, you're trying to make the weights small. You prevent the weights from from being large. And remember, this was what underlied um, so-called ridge regression, uh, which was adding these. Um, so this goes by different names. If you're doing um, if you're doing uh, gradient descent, which you do typically in neural networks, this is called weight decay. Okay. There's also L1 regularization. 
which instead of summing the squares of the weight, you sum the absolute values of the weights, okay? And this is usually called L1 regularization. It comes, it can be seen as coming from a Laplacian prior. I won't explain what, they, what this means. And it turns out that these promote sparse weights. If you solve a problem using L1 regularization, it is likely that some of the weights will be exactly zero. Okay, so this is a very hot topic today in deep networks, which is trying to find a model that has lots of zeros so that it's cheaper computationally. And one of the ways to do it, there are many things that can be done, is to include this kind of regularization. So almost all toolboxes to design to, to that have machine learning, not only deep machine learning, but all sorts of machine learning. When it comes to regularization, these are the two standard choices, L2, L1. And there's another one, which is called, I didn't include it here, it's called elastic net, which is the sum of the two. You can actually use both. You can use L1 plus L2, uh, which is sometimes called elastic net. It's a really stupid name, but that's what it's called. I don't, you know, I don't really understand why it's called elastic net. There's some reason, but it's a stupid reason. Okay. Now, using L2 in gradient methods is very easy. Remember that if we're doing gradient methods, we already know how to compute the gradient of these parts. That's what we spent a lot of time looking at, how to compute the gradient of these, be it for logistic loss, for, for, for linear regression problems, where this is just a squared loss, for uh, support vector machines, where it's a hinge loss, for sparse marks, which is the sparse marks loss. We know how to compute the gradient of these. We know how to compute the gradient of these. So what, what we, what's left is how to compute the gradient of these. Okay? But the gradient of the squared norm of a vector is just a vector itself with a one half behind. Remember like the like just like the derivative of u squared is just two times u. The same thing for the gradient of the norm squared of a vector is just the vector itself. Okay? Which means that when you're going, when you're doing gradient descent, you take your current weight, you subtract, you multiply the gradient of uh, of the loss by some constant and you subtract it from the weight and you also subtract a little bit of w itself because the gradient of this part is w itself which means that it's something plus something minus w itself times a constant so it's it's decaying it's decreasing a little bit weight the weight so it's, that's why it's called weight decay it's if you leave it alone if this gradient on this side was zero and you only did the gradient descent on this part you would go to zero because the gradient would take you to make w equal to zero which is actually the minimum of the norm it's when you are at the origin. So this goes by the name. It's, it's always interesting that all these very simple ideas are reinvented and rediscovered in different areas. Uh, actually, and I forgot to mention that these uh, using L1 regularization in neural networks, because of the fact that it will come out with zero weights, okay, is called some, in the first paper where it was proposed, it was called the optimal brain surgeon. Because the idea is that you cut connections. Yeah, like you're doing brain surgery on a, on a neural network. It's a kind of a weird name, but optimal brain. So if you know, if you want to know about optimal brain surgery, it's essentially using L1 regularization. Okay, not easy to use L1 regularization, not so easy to use again, because it's not differentiable, right? It's absolute value. Absolute value is not differentiable at the origin. And although we saw these for the hinge, for the hinge loss, this was a, a mild problem because there's non-differentiability at one point and the likelihood that I will be exactly there is zero. Okay, so you, 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 the probability that one of the points in the training set has exactly margin one is zero. So that's not a problem. You can simply ignore it, okay? And say it's minus one on the left, zero on the right. But here you cannot ignore it. Because the point where the L1 norm is not, is not differentiable is at the origin. And you know that lots of weights will be at the origin. And so the exact, you'll be exactly in the problem in the point that is problems. So doing dealing with L1 regularization is more complicated and you need more care. And there are specific techniques to do that, which I will not address. Okay. You cannot talk about machine learning without talking about bias, variance, and that trade-off. So what do I mean by bias and variance? Okay, let me try to explain in this, in this picture. Suppose we have this true function is this gray line, 
okay? This is a quadratic line. And I, I extracted three different training sets. So samples from those, from that gray line, say it's some quadratic function. And I extract, I don't know, maybe 20 points, 20 blue points, 20 orange triangles, 20 green squares. I have three data sets. And I'm gonna fit a straight line to all those three data sets. And I get those three lines, okay? This is what's called, this estimate as I said to have a high bias in the sense that everywhere you are, they're, they're, they're very wrong, okay? This distance between the, 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 the function and the true function is always pretty large. It's zero in some points, but on average, it's pretty large, the square of this distance. So it has a high bias. The, the, the function is on expectation always far from the true function. Although it has a very low variance because the fluctuation of these estimates is very small. All the functions are all the same, essentially, okay? Now, instead of just a straight line, let's fit a high order polynomial, like as many order as high as the number of points. You get those functions there, but three different data sets, you get those three different functions, the green, the orange, and the blue. This has very low bias. If you, on expectation, on expectation, the points of this free function, on expectation, they are exactly almost on top of the true function. But there's a lot of variance, right? Different functions are very different from each other. At some points, they are really, really different, right? So for example, this function is here, this function is here, this function is here, this function is here. So there's a lot of variance around the true function, okay? so. If you use low complexity or strong regularization, you have low variance, but high bias. The bias essentially captures, I could go 10 slides on this, but I'm not gonna do that. It's essentially a structural difference. So there's a, there's a systematic error that does not change with your different training sets. And if you have a high complexity or weak regularization, you have low bias because you can adjust very well to the data. So on X, but but from this from from training sample to training sample, it changes everything because the function is very uh, underdetermined, and you can have very different things. And so this very famous plot, which is the bias variance trade off, on the on the horizontal axis we have model complexity, or if you want inverse regularization parameter. Okay, and what happens is that if you have a very high model complexity, you have a very small bias. Bias is going down, but the variance is going up. Okay, and so if you could compute the actual test error, so what is the error between the function that you're estimating and the true underlying function, you would find out that it behaves sort of like this, okay? It has a, an optimal choice of model complexity, which is the one you're looking for, which is the one that essentially captures the behavior of the function, but uh, is not too complicated or too simple. So it's kind of a sweet spot, okay? But, things are much more complicated than this, okay? This picture does not explain why machine learning works these days with large, large models with deep networks, okay? So the modern view is this. On the left, we have the traditional view, okay? Which is complexity going up, training risk going down. Notice that the training loss, in this case, the training loss is zero. The functions are going exactly through each point. They're interpolating the points. No, no loss is zero, okay? So the traditional picture is the one on the left. As the training loss, as the complexity of the model goes up or the regularization goes down, the test, the, the, the test risk goes down and then up again, okay? And if you're fitting a polynomial with, with and you start increasing the order of the polynomial, when you reach uh, interpolate, the interpolating regime, which is when you make it, so you have the order of the polynomial equal to the number of points, you go through each point, but in the middle, in between the points, the function is wild. It goes really wild everywhere. And so it does not a good approximation. And so the test risk goes up. But what, the, what happens is that if you keep on going and make the model more and more complex, it turns out that the risk comes down again, okay? And this has not seen, seen before because people did not, did not explore these, who would fit a polynomial of order 100 to 20 points? No one, right? Why would you do it? But it happens, it works, okay? And this was discovered because of neural net. This was discovered in 2018 and 19. 
that this picture does not explain neural networks because neural networks have millions of parameters and sometimes many more parameters than training points and still they work. <clears throat> and you need to look at the picture on the right. So when you are in the interpolating regime, the objective function that you're minimizing is different. Okay, you typically use these. Okay, you, in, you insist on interpolating. You say, okay, if I can, I will achieve zero training error. I have a function that goes through all the points, no error, zero training loss. Okay, and among all the weights that satisfy zero training loss, I'm going to choose the one with the smallest norm. So it changes, right? Instead of weighting the two and trying to, 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 to minimize the sum of the two, I'm going to fix one at zero because I can and minimize the other. Okay, it is a different criterion. It's called a minimum norm criterion. Okay, this is an active research topic. There are papers, I'll show you some results, which is a paper from last month uh, in the next slide. Okay, so let's see if we understand intuitively why this works. So, this is the problem. This function there on the left, this paper, that's the archive. You can look at it in the slides. This function that's being approximated is the, the quality is not great, but is uh, something like cosine of, I think it's something like 2x plus cosine of 5x or something like that. It's that function. It's not a polynomial. It's whatever function that is. Okay. And you have some points. The points are not clearly visible. Let me see. Let me zoom in. Okay. There's, there's a few points, not many, I think 20 points or something. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and six. I think it's 20 points, okay? This is a fitting like a second or third order polynomial, okay? It's not expressive enough, okay? Now you increase the order of the polynomial and see in the interpolating regime, it's what I was saying, right? You can go exactly through each point because you have order 20, I think actually, uh, yeah, it's 20, order 20, 20 points. You go exactly through each point, but between the points, the function is crazy. It's completely wrong, right? It's completely wild. But if you keep on increasing and increasing and increasing, when you reach, I think, 100 or order 100, this is what happens, okay? The problem is among all the possible other 100 polynomials that go through these 20 points, you have freedom to choose one which has small norm in the weights, which behaves much better than the one with only 20 weights, okay? So this is sort of the intuition behind this uh, double descent phenomenon, is that by making it really, really over-parameterized, you can choose a good model, okay? Not so, you know, you're not forced to, to one that does exactly that and it's completely wild in the middle. And this is the, the plot, the double descent plot. Notice that it looks, in the over-parameterized regime, it looks like the optimal, loss is here this is around 50 i think yeah this is sort of 20 this is probably 40 or 50 i don't know and it looks like it's only a little better than the one on this side okay it's a little better but notice the scale okay this goes from this goes to 10 to the 9 so it's a uh, thousand it's uh, 1 billion in american billions so it's it's significantly better in the sense that this is significantly better than this, okay? Okay, this is just, a, of course, a toy problem with, uh, so keep in mind these classical machine learning and statistics, but this is the modern picture for large over-parameterized complex models. Okay, finally, a little bit about nonlinear models. We're reaching the, the that time limit. So we have covered now up to now perceptrons, logistic and sparse max regression, support vector machines. They all lead to convex optimization problems, no issues with local minima or initialization because everything is well behaved. All assume the feature map is well engineered uh, such that the data is linearly separable. Remember, linearly separable in the phi space, never in the X space, okay? Always linear separability in the space of features. And the features, I assume they were well designed such that the separability is achieved. Okay, what if the data even in the feature space is not linear separable? Well, you can call the engineer to engineer better features. Okay, say, okay, it's not working. Please give me better features. Uh, it might work. 
Um, you can use kernel methods, which is what we'll see next uh, briefly. They work implicitly in high dimensions, but you still need to design to engineer a kernel. It's, a, it's equivalent in that sense. Um, and you can use one of many other methods. There are many other methods that do not assume separability. Come on. Okay, for example, trees, random forests, nearest neighbors, okay? Or tomorrow's lecture, embrace nonlinearity, embrace non-convexity. Instead of engineering features, learn the representation from the data and use the many tricks of the trade so you'll, you'll learn about it tomorrow. Okay, but today, let's look at a method that doesn't assume anything about the data, essentially. Uh, so in nearest neighbor classifier, how does it work? You keep all your data. I've seen, maybe some of you have seen it. You keep all your data, the X's and the labels. And now for a test sample, you just return the majority class in the K nearest neighbor. So you, you have a new point X, you look through all the X eyes in the training set and you find say the five closest ones. And you say, what is the class that is in the majority in that little set? And that's the class that you predict. So visually it looks like this. Well, so if you have these blue and red training points, the, the regions that are painted in blue and, and, and pink or whatever, are those where the, where the nearest neighbor is from class blue or from class red. Okay, it's for k equals one, k equals seven. So for k equals, what happens when we increase k is that you sign kind of smooth the boundary. Okay, what is the underlying assumption? Is that nearby points are in the same class, essentially. That's all that's assumed. No other complicated assumptions. And if you have a large enough K, you can actually have class probability estimates. Because for example, if in those seven nearest neighbors, all of them are from class blue, then the probability of class blue is one. But if like you have like, for example, like here, if in, this in the seven nearest neighbors, five are from class blue and two are from class red, then your probability estimate is that five over seven is the probability of one of the classes and two over seven is the probability of the other class. So you can just count the proportion of the, of the classes in the nearest neighbors and you have class probability estimates. What are the pros and cons? Pros, no training, no algorithms, no optimization, nothing. It's just stored data. Of course, it's easy to implement, very few assumptions, it's very intuitive and very hot topic. It's intrinsically explainable. Explainability for machine learning is a very hot topic. Why did the machine do that decision? Here, it's ex explicitly, it's explicitly intrinsically explainable because the seven closest examples are these. That's it, okay? It's also very closely connected to the way we reason. We reason a lot by example. When you meet someone, you immediately say, this guy looks like this other guy I met, so he's gonna probably say this and that. Okay, we, we use a lot of nearest neighbor reasoning. Of course, the cons of these are you need to store all the data. So you don't extract anything. You need to define a distance measure, how to compare objects. If it's easy for, for vectors, it's not so, how do you compare two, te two texts or two images, okay? To see if they're far or, or not, okay? It has decent performance, but not top performance in any problems. And it's very slow if you have a large dimension, a large and high dimensional data set because you need to search. Although there are tricks, there are ways to create data structures that make this, this search um, very fast. We may, may wonder if this is an obsolete technique. So uh, yesterday someone sent me this paper. This is being presented this week at ACL. So where Andre is right now, uh, it's called a low resource text classification parameter free method for using compressors. And as you see in yellow there, it uses just a K nearest neighbor classifier and it achieves test accuracy on out of distribution data, which is better than all these BERTs and large pre-trained models uh, just using nearest neighbor classifier. But of course the issue is need to define a distance. How to define a distance between text. It uses a very clever technique based on joint compression, which I don't I won't go into, it's using, but it's, it's a very interesting paper. If you want to look at how it's still, K nearest neighbors are still being used um, today. Finally, let me just highlight that uh, we have go for five more minutes. There are essentially two perspectives on building machine learning systems. Uh, this feature-based, which is everything you've see, seen up to now, except for k-nearest neighbors. 
which is objects are described by vectors of characteristics, okay, a feature map. And similarity-based methods. So K nearest neighbor is a similarity-based method. All you need to know is to compute how similar an object is to another object. You don't need features, you just need similarities. Although the, the, the boundary is sometimes unclear. And uh, kernels are a class of methods that belongs to this uh, area of similarity-based methods. So it's again, a very powerful technique, very class of, class of methods. Essentially based on something called the kernel, which is a similarity function that takes pairs of objects and produces a real number. And the objects have no assumptions whatsoever. Okay, collection of chairs, if you want. As long as you know, give me a, a function to measure how similar two, two chairs are, I'm, I'm in game. Okay, so a valid kernel is, all it has to satisfy is be symmetric. So similarity between A and B and B and A is the same. Okay. And it needs to be such that it has this property. If you have a collection of objects of any size and any collection of objects, and you compute, um, you compute this matrix, which is all the pairwise similarities, you put it in a matrix, this matrix needs to be positive semi-definite. You need to satisfy this property, for those of you who know what positive semi-definite is. And if this is okay, then you can use these. You can, I'm, I'm gonna skip it quickly. It turns out that you can show that instead, that when you're computing a kernel, the similarity, you're essentially doing the same as computing a feature map, maybe into a, a, a feature space that has infinite dimensions, okay? But you don't really explicitly need to go there. You can do everything in a low dimension. You can do everything directly on the objects themselves, not on the, the feature vector, the feature space. So it's implicit. I will skip this. I will skip this. I'll just show this is a usual, zero uh, in, uh, basic level introduction to kernels. Suppose you have that data set, the blues and the, and the red circles. That, it's not linearly separable, clearly. You need a circle, okay? Let's do this feature transformation. Feature transformation is, it looks like this. It goes from a two-dimension to a three-dimensional space. And the feature transformation is like this, to a, a given point here with co component x1, x2. I will map into x1 squared, x2 squared, and x1 times x2 times square root of two, okay? And if I map, so this is the transformation that is this, if this transformation, phi, okay, is what's mapping these points from those points. Now it becomes linearly separable. In this three-dimensional space, it's clearly linearly separable. Essentially because all the blue points are close to the origin and the others are far away from the origin, okay? Now, if I want to do some linear classifier on this feature space, I need to be able to compute inner products in that feature space. And it turns out that if you follow these methods, just trivial math, if you compute the inner product between one point and another point in the three dimensional space, it's essentially, it's not essentially, it's exactly the same as just computing the inner product in the first space and then squaring it, okay? Which means that you can do this computations in the high dimensional space, you can do them implicitly on the lower dimensional space. You never need to go to the high dimensional space. Okay, so in a sense, kernels are sort of uh, uh, tractable nonlinearities, okay? Uh, it's usually much easier than, 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 than calculating corresponding dot product in the high dimensional space. It's what I, I said about the kernel trick. Now, during the late 90s and, uh, and early 2000s, there was a, a, a rush to kernelization. So all the algorithms, any algorithm that you can write that ends up depending on inner product, you can kernelize. And so those kernelized everything, kernelized risk regression, kernelized SVM, kernelized SVMs, kernelized Kalman filters, kernelized nearest neighbors, kernelized everything. So everything goes kernelized, not caramelized, kernelized. The drawback usually is that it's expensive. The cost is quadratic on the data set size because you need always need that matrix that has all the pairwise similarities. So it grows quadratically. And again, like a feature map, the beauty of this is that it decouples the learning algorithm from the data, from the details of the data. You can design kernels for strings, for images, for sets, for signals, for graphs, for probabilities, for anything. And the algorithm that's gonna use the kernels doesn't need to know what the objects are. It just takes the kernel and the values and it produces a classifier or whatever, okay? So it, the, the, this decoupling of the learning algorithm from the details of the data that's provided by the, the kernels. Okay, reaching the end. 
not too, not too bad. So conclusions. I don't really like conclusions because there's no conclusions. It's just a summary. So linear models are this broad class that includes well-known perceptrons, logistic regression, support vector machines, and other stuff. Uh, the, the beauty of, of linear models is that the third bu bullet is that they either can be solved in closed forms, say for regression, or they have sort of benign and easy to solve convex optimization problems. Stochastic gradient descent is very important because it can be used and it allows you to deal with very large data sets. Actually, there's more, that, there's more to it. It can be shown that stochastic gradient descent actually has a role to play in the, in the solution that it chooses in, in, uh, in the overparameterized case, but I have no way to go there. Uh, of course, linear models rely on, on feature representations. And tomorrow you will learn about these, how deep neural networks um, learn internal representations. I leave you with recommended books. Okay, this is the books that I, I recommend for people starting in machine learning uh, from more, like from, this is an absolutely amazing book. I love this book, Ben Recht and Moritz Hart. Uh, it's called Patterns, Predictions and Actions. It has a very original take on machine learning. It's, ex it's an excellent book. I really like it. It goes also into topics such as causality reinforcement learning because it goes into actions, not only predictions. Then there's this very much more technical book uh, by Francis Bach called Learning Theory from First Principles, which covers everything. It's ex particularly strong in the stochastic optimization part. And there's this huge book, I think it's a thousand pages, uh, probabilistic machine learning, which has everything you will ever want to know about probabilistic machine learning. They're all available online for free, legally. It's not okay. So, uh, and so that's it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so of course, I'll be glad to take questions either now or uh, during, I'll be here the whole week, not tomorrow, but I'll be here tomorrow. I cannot come, but I'll be here Monday, Tuesdays, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. And the slides are now online. They were not in the beginning, but they have been, They've been put online during the, the coffee break. I think everybody's hungry. There is no question. Hi, thanks. That was really good. Um, I was just going to ask a quick, quick question about um, in the overparameterized case where you set the constraint for the loss to be zero, um, is there any intuition or a nice higher level way of um, explaining how you then decide? which model to pick, given that you've already set that constraint, which I think you described as the um, minimum norm criterion. Yeah. But I didn't grasp. Yeah, so what, the, yeah, the, I, I, I skipped that detail under the right. So what can be shown is that if you, if you start, if you start your optimization problem, be it batch gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent at zero, okay, it can be shown that the, the solution to which you converge in the same conditions will be a minimum norm solution with zero loss if it's achievable, okay? So the choice of algorithm makes, makes a difference. So the, the, it, it's, it's something called implicit regularization. So some, some algorithms, well, this is covered very clearly in this book actually, in the book on, on the left. So if, for some algorithms, uh, if, you start, if you start at zero, essentially, there's other places where you can start, but if you start at zero parameters, the algorithms are guaranteed to do this implicit regularization without you having to explicitly hard code this in the algorithm. Actually, what you're actually solving is this. Yeah. Okay. You're looking for, for small, for a, to explain this, I would need something else, which is the representative theorem, and the, but I cannot explain it, but intuit intuitively it's not easy. The idea is that when you start at zero, the, the weights that are added to the, to the model are only those that are, that are uh, um, I'm missing the word, that are actually needed to make the, the interpolation error go to zero, okay? And you never increase the other part, okay? Because it's orthogonal in a sense. It's, uh, I, can, I, can, I can explain it to you more carefully. It, it, takes, it, takes, a while. it takes five minutes. Thank you.
Right. If there's no other questions, let's thank the speaker again.